Thank you, Varinha. Uh, good afternoon and welcome to Brussels. Um, as it was said, this is the, the final conference uh, of our joint project between the European Commission and uh, the OECD, uh, working on cross-border governance. Our objective was to identify the key elements of a good cross-border governance, uh, and on that basis to provide a tool for all the border regions so that they can work on this on their own. Cross-border cooperation is very important uh, for the European Commission. The first reason is that one third of the EU citizens live along a border, so that's quite a lot. The second reason is that um, it is there that one of the big achievements of the EU, which is the single market, uh, will face still some obstacles. So it is our role in the Commission to fix these obstacles. And the third reason is that cross-border cooperation creates a lot of opportunities um, for citizens and enterprises. For example, if you are a job seeker, you have job opportunities on the other side of the border. If uh, you uh, run a public service, maybe it's worth having a shared investment, for example, on a joint hospital. If you are an SME, being along a border gives you more opportunities for your um, uh, supply chain and also bigger markets for your sales. The same goes for tourism, where you can do a joint marketing. And above all, people along borders have a lot to gain by exchanging experiences amongst them. So for all these reasons, for us in the Commission, uh, working on cross-border cooperation and hence on cross-border governance is very important. Therefore, in the past years... Uh, <coughs> La Commission travaille de plus en plus euh, sur la, la politique transfrontalière et nous voulons que la frontière s'efface en quelque sorte. Donc, ce que nous souhaitons, c'est vous expliquer tout ce que nous faisons euh, au niveau euh, de la frontière. Et cela s'articule en huit points. Premièrement, nous souhaitons euh, développer, maintenir et euh, accroître la confiance mutuelle entre citoyens. Malheureusement, ce n'est pas toujours euh, le cas. Souvent, à proximité des frontières, les gens n'ont que très peu de contact les uns avec les autres à cause d'obstacles naturels comme des montagnes ou des rivières, mais peut-être aussi à cause d'obstacles linguistiques. Et parfois, c'est dû à des stéréotypes. Le fait de se connaître et de se faire confiance, c'est la base de toute coopération. C'est la raison pour laquelle nous favorisons les, activi les activités qui impliquent les citoyens, et notamment les échanges entre écoles. Notre deuxième objectif consiste à organiser des euh, projets conjoints concrets. Il s'agit des projets interreg classiques que nous euh, finançons par le biais des programmes interreg. Et dans le cadre de la euh, période de programmation actuel, ce financement s'élève à 7 milliards d'euros, donc pour la période 2021-2027. Troisième objectif, supprimer les obstacles qui compliquent la vie des gens au quotidien. Et nous devons faire en sorte que les autorités responsables prennent les choses en main. De notre côté, à la Commission européenne, nous avons au moins trois instruments. Tout d'abord, uh, B uh, solutions. I precisely what the obstacles are and recommend the actions to be done to reduce them. The idea is that the authorities would then change the laws, the rules, the practices, the IT systems, etc., so that the obstacle is reduced. The second instrument that we provide is funding under especially the Interreg programs, where we have a dedicated objective on reducing the legal and administrative border obstacles, allowing the authorities and stakeholders on the ground to work on these. And this has a lot of potential for a relatively low cost. 
And the third instrument that we have is a legal proposal called Facilitating Cross-Border Solutions, also known as FCBS, which is an optional tool to provide a single procedure to tackle obstacles of a legislative and administrative nature. It follows, for those who know the acronym, the ECBM proposal that we did uh, um, a, a few years ago. It is currently being discussed in the Council and in the Parliament. The fourth objective uh, that we have in the Commission is to embed the border dimension in the EU legislation and in the EU instruments. In the Commission, we have established a small cell in DG Regio called the Border Focal Point, and one of its role is to make the link between the border regions needs and the different services of the Commission, answering questions, discussing important border projects like transport links, checking new EU regulations and instruments to ensure that the EU policies do not have a negative impact on the border regions and even have a positive impact on them, promoting also the territorial impact assessment. So you see all that uh, we do through the border focal point. Another important task of the border focal point is to generate and to exchange knowledge on cross-border cooperation. So we do many studies, such as one on the impact of COVID on border regions, or another one on the cross-border labor data. We also have a website. We also organize conferences. We have a newsletter. And quite regularly, we organize online workshops on key topics, such as cross-border health. The sixth objective in the Commission is to put cross-border cooperation high on the agenda of EU national and regional policymakers. We have done a communication which at EU level is the highest political statement we can make on cross-border cooperation, as well as a report. And there we said that border regions are actually the living labs of the European integration, because it's there along the borders that you can see how actually the EU works in practice. We have identified four priorities for the coming years. Improve the resilience of border regions through deeper institutional cooperation. And the conference today is about that. To have more and better cross-border public services, because we believe that there is a lot to gain in terms of efficiency and in terms of economy. The third objective is to develop vibrant cross-border labor markets because it's a good way to reduce unemployment and to bring uh, uh, resources to the enterprises who can have a potential to, to grow. And finally, it's to make the border regions contribute to the European Green Deal. The seventh big objective that we have uh, in terms of cross-border cooperation is to have joint legal bodies. Because for every ambitious cross-border cooperation, there will be issues linked to the legal responsibilities and to the financial contracting. And this requires a cross-border legal body. And for this, the EU has created a legal instrument called the European Grouping of Territorial Cooperation, so-called EGTCs. And so far, there are about 90 of them all over the EU. The last objective, the eighth one, is what we are here today, it's the cross-border governance. In all our work, in, in the objectives I just mentioned, we saw that a key element to develop a cross-border territory is to have the public authorities, the stakeholders, and the civil society work together. So not only a governance based on national authorities, but really a governance of the cross-border living basin. Here I want to thank the OECD and the colleagues who work on that project, because the results that will be presented today uh, are really very interesting, useful, and have a lot of potential to significantly improve 
cross-border cooperation in the EU. As a conclusion, the EU is facing a non-precedented crisis in terms of severity and also in terms of number of crises. These are testing the effectiveness, cohesion and unity of the EU. Some think that reinforcing national borders is the solution to co cope with this crisis. However, when facing a big challenge, it is never the case that alone you can do better than together. It is never the case that less cooperation is better than more cooperation. This is why it is crucial to have good cross-border cooperation governance. Borders shall not remain the scars of European history. On the contrary, they shall become the cement that keeps people together, sharing the same Europe and working on their common future. I hope you will find this conference interesting and have a good conference. Thank you. Thank you very much, Olivier, and also to remind us that cross-border regions are living labs of European integration and the point of Europe. Um, I'd like to invite uh, Dorothée Alain Dupré from the OECD as head of the Regional Development and Multilevel Governance Division to say a few words. Thank you, Varenia. Thank you very much, uh, Olivier, for your opening uh, remarks and your very important words. Um, I would like to thank you all for being uh, with us uh, today. Welcome, welcome to all on behalf of the OECD. And first, I would like to thank very much uh, the European Commission and DG Radio for the opportunity to work on this very important initiative and for all their active support to cross-border uh, cooperation that Olivier just uh, recalled with all the, the many initiatives that the Commission takes. I would like to thank all of you who have been uh, very actively involved in the project so far. I know the missions and the workshop organized uh, so far were extremely fruitful, and your experiences and input uh, will form the basic, the basis uh, for the work uh, presented uh, today. So we are very pleased to have this uh, opportunity to gather all of you today to take a step back and explore how to build more resilient cross-border regions and discuss the OECD cross-border governance framework and tool uh, as support to do so. So I, I would like to just to, to remind uh, why cross-border governance uh, matters and Olivier has uh, already uh, mentioned some of the key factors. Uh, so cross-border regions in the European Union, they account for 40% of the EU territory and home to 30% of the population, as reminded by uh, Olivier. Cross-border regions are crucial for the future of the single market, which is so debated uh, today. It's actually not a surprise to see that this topic came up quite prominently in the LETA's report that was published uh, last month and is expected to be an important point of the report from the Prime Minister Draghi on the future of EU competitiveness. Despite uh, being geographically diverse with uh, rural and sparsely populated communities as well as urban agglomeration, cross-border regions often face similar development challenges, and I would like to mention five. First, they are often distanced from large urban centers with more limited access to healthcare and other essential services than other uh, regions. Second, there are often significant differences in terms of labor productivity per capita income and public service delivery on opposite sides of the border. Third, road and rail transport connections tend to be lower in border regions, limiting the movement of people and goods and straining their development potential. Fourth, it is in cross-border regions where differences in national laws and regulations can have the most important cost. A 2017 study estimated that losses stemming from the legal and administrative barriers in cross-border regions 
to be 458 billion euros. These losses account for 8.8% of cross-border regions uh, GDP. And fifth, cross-border regions are also particularly vulnerable in crisis situations, as evidenced by the, 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 the example of the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic, for example. So the economic impact of border restrictions introduced because of the pandemic for border regions was more than twice the average in other regions. So in an effort to overcome these challenges and unleash the potential of their uh, border regions, many local, regional, and national governments have set up cross-border governance mechanisms with the support of the European Union. For instance, by 2023, 90 European grouping of territorial cooperation that Olivier mentioned had been established across Europe. In parallel, a growing number of, bo of border regions are providing public services on a cross-border basis, for example, in the field of healthcare, education, and transport. More than 1,500 cross-border public service delivery initiatives were recorded in 2022. Robust cross-border uh, governance can benefit regions in many ways. Let me take just maybe three concrete examples from the project. First, robust cross-border governance can help increase uh, the access to and the quality of public services in border communities. For instance, the creation of the EGTC Cerdania Hospital ensures access to quality health care in a sparsely populated regions on the French-Spanish French border. Second, it can help draw attention to development challenges that are better resolved through cross-border collaboration than on a purely local basis. For instance, cross-border cooperation bodies along the French-Luxembourg border work together to raise awareness about the need for integrated spatial planning to manage a sharp increase in cross-border workers. And third, it can help build trust in government and nurture a shared sense of cross-border identity. Another example is the European metropolis, Lille, uh, Cortic, Tournai in France and Belgium, which promotes the cross-border area as a shared space defined by its many waterways and common history. For cross-border governance to be effective and durable, however, a number of elements of preconditions need to be in place. And, and let me share just some preliminary findings from the project. Policymakers on both sides of the border need a clear and shared understanding of shared challenges and opportunities, as well as com a common agreement to tackle them on a cross-border basis to build trust. They also need to involve uh, relevant public and non-governmental actors, citizens, uh, in the development of cross-border governance structures, plans, and projects, as, again, was reminded by Olivier, it's also essential uh, to ensure that cooperating partners have the resources necessary to support their implementation. And finally, in a context of frequent elections on either side of the border, it is critical to continuously invest in generating and maintaining political engagement and support for cross-border cooperation. This can allow ambitions to be translated into concrete actions and result in tangible improvements the lives of cross-border citizens. So through this project, the OECD is specifically assessing the governance arrangement supporting uh, cooperation. The aim is, is really to provide analysis tools and recommendations that cross-border regions in the EU and beyond can use to establish or reinforce their cross-border governance bodies. As part of this uh, project, the OECD has developed a preliminary cross-border governance framework and tool, which will be presented by uh, Stefan in, in, a, in a minute. The framework pro provides a way for policymakers to think through and engage with cross-border partnerships. It establishes four broad uh, governance-oriented dimensions, institution, strategy design, implementation and monitoring, funding and financing, and communication and advocacy. The tool takes these dimensions and provides practical step-by-step -step actions and considerations to help policymakers navigate the challenges of establishing an operating cross-governance body. So during the event, we will take a deep dive into several of the governance areas covered by the tool. 
We will do this by exploring practical experiences from cross-border cooperation initiatives from across the EU, and you will also have the chance uh, to share your insights into how we can strengthen the tool and increase its usefulness. The final version of the tool uh, will be published in, this, in December this year, along with an analytical report presenting the main finding of this project and policy recommendations for policymakers working on cross-border cooperation. So I very much look forward to the discussion, to learning from all of you. Thank you again very much to all. Thank you very much, Dorothée, and also for um, reminding us why cross-border cooperation is so important and its role in supporting economies and services and also overall quality of life for residents in cross-border regions. So I would like to now invite uh, my colleague Stéphane Visser, uh, who works in the um, Regional Development and Multilevel Governance Division to present a bit the project and the tool and um, get us started in our, in, in our discussions. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for those kind words, uh, Verinia. Um, First of all, it's really great to see uh, all of you uh, being with us today, especially the representatives of the pilot regions with, which we, with whom we've worked so much over the past uh, about 18 months. Thank you so much for your continued uh, commitment and support to this initiative. So the objective, as Verinia uh, already stated, of this uh, sort of first presentation of the day relates to, basically we want to share a little bit about the project uh, in addition to what Olivier and Dorothée have already commented, and then going to detail on the preliminary uh, cross-border uh, cross -border governance framework and tool, which we have uh, prepared and which uh, uh, we are very happy to share with you, and also to hear from you what you think throughout the today and, and tomorrow, what you think can be improved to make this document <coughs> as useful, this tool as useful to your colleagues, uh, to cross-border policy uh, workers, uh, policy um, makers. So structure, as I said, first a few words about the project, then look a cl close look at the framework and the tool, uh, a, little, a few words about the agenda for today and for tomorrow, and finally some next steps in the project. Um, so let's take a step back before talking about the tool, about the, the, the project. So some words have already been uh, shared about the context in which this uh, initiative takes place in terms of the, the objectives of the European Union, the European Commission, but also in terms of what are we talking about, the, uh, what are cross-border regions. As stated, they, they represent about 30% of the EU's population, 40% of its territory. They tend to perform uh, less well economically than other regions because of, for example, their distance to uh, urban centers, but also because of the many uh, obstacles already alluded to in terms of legal and regulatory obstacles, differences, uh, in, in, in regulation and legislation that, for example, makes it difficult to provide uh, services on a cross-border basis that link to link markets to give uh, private sector representatives a chance to, uh, to work uh, really uh, on a cross-border basis. And obviously, really important to mention uh, the COVID pandemic, which has shed light on, on the plight of cross-border regions, showing attention to what... Um, what challenges, physical challenges to the movement of people and goods can do to the development uh, potential and to the lives and livelihoods of uh, cross-border residents. Um, also, I'd like to mention that um, this project obviously takes place in a, in a setting in which there are already, as mentioned, about 90 or perhaps even more so EGTCs, European Groupings of Territory Cooperation. Uh, there are also more than uh, 100, uh, 1,500 uh, cross-border service delivery initiatives that already uh, are being implemented, which will be comment on, uh, commented on later today. So um, there's much fertile ground for this, this discussion. And then just, just to recap very quickly the objectives of this program. So on the one hand, it, the objective is to, is to work with five pilot regions, which you see located on, on the map on the right side, 
um, to analyze how cross-border cooperation is structured in these regions, which partners are collaborating, what are their objectives, what are their experiences, and what are the results that they are achieving, but also what are, the, what are some of the challenges that they have been facing. And then to, based on the knowledge uh, and the experiences for each of the five regions, uh, create a, a detailed tool for them to, to work through some of the, the, the most urgent challenges. But what really brings us here today is the second part, is to build on the collective experiences, the, the strengths, but also the challenges faced by the five private regions, plus by the sort of the, the collective of cross-border practitioners and experts to develop an analysis, to develop tools, to develop recommendations that can serve policymakers involved in cross-border cooperation. So we're talking about national level uh, policymakers, regional level policymakers, subnational policymakers, uh, in terms of how to either establish a cross-border cooperation initiative or cross-border governance bodies such as the EDTC, in case no, none exist, or to reinforce it, to ensure that sort of next steps can be taken to deliver, to better deliver on shared cross-border objectives. So these are the five pilot regions with whom we've had the pleasure to be working. Um, I won't go, I won't present the, the regions in detail. Uh, all of the regions have the, the possibility to, uh, to give presentations today and, and tomorrow linked to the this, uh, different thematic sessions that we'll have. Um, but we've been working with the EGTC Niemann Nimenus. It's one of the most, regions, EG, uh, most recently established EGTCs, uh, which groups uh, subnational representatives from uh, northeastern Poland and southern Lithuania. We've been working with also with the oldest EGTC, the Eurometropole uh, Lille Cotrec Tournai, which includes representatives or which groups 14 different uh, national, regional, and local governments uh, from, from uh, France and from Belgium. We work with a consortium of three organizations and institutions in uh, France and Luxembourg, the EGTC Alzette Belval, Paul Metropolitain um, uh, Frontalier, and ProSud. The latter two are not EGTCs, they're sort of local uh, sub-regional associations of local governments. Um, then we also work with EGTC Cerdania Hospital, um, which is still the only fully-fledged cross-border hospital in, uh, in, in the European uh, Union. And we work with EGTC Rio Minho, uh, which uh, is, uh, is composed of two sub-regional governments in northern Portugal and in Galicia, representing over 20 municipalities. You'll be hearing from their experiences and their practices over the next day and a half. So for our project, and in order to meet the objectives that are outlined, we developed an initial sort of conceptual framework to be thinking about cross-border governance. We're looking at framework conditions. So for example, or analyzing the framework conditions uh, and how they affect cross-border cooperation in each of the regions, looking at issues such as uh, physical barriers, but also shared history in terms of cooperation, differences in the territorial administrative structure of countries, in the assignment of res responsibilities, because a local government in one country may not have the same competences as uh, the one in the other. Um, we also look at actors and their interactions. So which public and non-governmental bodies are collaborating? Within who has a vote in EDTCs? Who can decide? Uh, do civil society organizations, do, si do private sector representatives, do they have a voice and a vote in terms of what, uh, the strategic decision-making on cross-border collaboration? We also look at strategy and implementation, comparing the strategic objectives of the different uh, cross-border initiatives that range from uh, networking, um, providing a, a sort of uh, a, a space to, to broker between uh, uh, government officials on both sides to bring uh, citizens in, in contact with each other to providing a very tangible service, such as in the case of the EGTC Serdanya Hospital. And we look at means. So what are the financial resources? What are the human resources available and necessary to make this work, to ensure that the cross-border governance bodies have the, have the tools to, to fulfill their objectives, to meet their objectives? For example, here we're also, we've been looking at cross-border data. Um, then I would like to share just a few of the common challenges that we have identified by working with the five, uh, five pilot regions and also assessing cross-border collaboration initiatives in other, in other regions. 
So in terms of framework conditions, as said, in several, there's a limited sense of a shared cross-border identity of citizens in our meetings with civil society organizations, but also with public officials, seeing this as, as a challenge and a focus point, focal point for their attention. But also the differences in assignment of responsibilities uh, and territory administrative structures. Uh, I could mention the example of uh, local governments in Spain and in Portugal, which have very different uh, uh, competences. So how do you make sure that within that different constellation, you can work together on, uh, on concrete projects? And obviously not to mention differences in, in, in culture, in language, etc. In terms of actors and in their interactions, one of the main challenges that was expressed by, by our partners is the challenge of not securing perhaps political engagement and support, uh, on the asset, but rather maintaining it over time. Often there's a first bust of, of enthusiasm that leads to the creation of an EGTC, but how to maintain that uh, in order to not only ensure that the EGTC or another cross-border collaboration initiative maintains, but it also that there's political support to address the legal, the regulatory, the financial challenges that are encountered along the way, or to reshape, for example, the, the mission of an EGTC to meet changing needs. Also, an, an, another challenge that is identified here is high levels of political turnover. Every country faces with frequent elections, but working on a cross-border basis, it is every few months or so, it seems. So how do you maintain a sense of direction in that environment? How do you adjust your strategic planning documents to, to give space for political, different political uh, opinions to, to integrate, but also to have a sense of, of continuity? Um, how do you raise awareness in incoming, for incoming politicians of what the cross-border collaboration uh, is about, what results have been achieved, but also what are some of the challenges moving forward? Um, and obviously ensuring the participation of non-governmental actors. Many GTCs, many cross-border cooperation bodies, really driven by public actors. But can space be created for non-government actors to participate? Yes, there are several examples, but uh, the experiences differ here quite a lot. Hopefully this is also a topic that can be mentioned today. When going to means, uh, sorry, to strategy and implementation, the, as will be discussed uh, in, the, in the following session, we see very different approaches to strategic planning in terms of setting objectives for the short, medium, and the long term. In terms of, uh, but not only, uh, not only that, on what is our uh, developing a shared approach to, to strategic planning. Do we need strategic planning for the, the cross-border organization? Do we need a strategic plan for the cross-border region as such? Do we need to... Uh, strengthen the, the incorporation of a cross-border perspective in existing plans. Um, so there are very different practices here, different experiences. And what we also see is that there is the challenge of moving from strategy design to implementation is a particular hard one, especially because cross-border cooperation involves so many different public actors and non-governmental actors working at the different levels because it touches upon so many different sectors. So how do you mobilize all these actors to achieve your objectives. Also an issue that came up time and time again is how do we measure results? How do we make sure that if we have a strategic planning document that we're able to tr track progress and to adjust our prog programming and our spending accordingly? And then finally, the issue obviously of funding and financing. How to not only ensure funding and financing for cross-border projects, but also how to main ensure that the cross-border governance body has sufficient resources to, to continue day-to-day -day operations and to adjust to changing needs and changing demands from its members. And how to look beyond interreg funding. How to make sure that the resource mobilization is diversified. Um, it also relates to the, the, the uh, another ch uh, challenge that we identified was that related to the human resource capacity. Human resource capacity for strategic planning. Uh, human resource capacity for identifying and mobilizing funds. Uh, there were many comments that we heard on increasing technical difficulties in preparing mature project proposals, in, in ensuring in-house expertise on topics for which there is much funding available currently, on digitalization, on the green transition, etc. So that's a little introduction. Um,
Let's move to the tool, the cross-border framework and the cross-border tool. So who is this, who is this framework and who is, what, who is the, the target audience for the tool? Well, first and foremost, it is national and subnational governments that are interested either in, as I said, establishing new or reinforcing existing cross-border governance mechanisms. But it's also for international organization institutions, non-governmental uh, organizations, research institutions. For example, to start with the latter, research institutions can use this tool, for example, to, to assess, to help assess whether cross-border initiatives are meeting their objectives, to identify a space to collaborate, to contribute to the design of a cross-border strategic plan, um, or to, for example, collaborate in the creation and maintenance of a cross-border observatory, as many have, has been, have been established across the EU. And then what are the objectives? And I would like to separate a little bit the tool and the framework. The framework, which consists of several, of four dimensions, which I'll present in a second, it, the objective is to help policymakers to conceptualize what cross-border governance is about, to have a full sense of what it implies, either setting up an EGTC, setting up a cross-border service delivery initiative, to take into consideration different elements, and also to be able to communicate uh, about some of the challenges. And then when we come to the tool, which is sort of a practical version of, of, the, of the framework, it has four main objectives linked to the four pillars or dimensions of the framework. First, it is to assess the need for enhanced cross-border cooperation to address shared challenges, development challenges and opportunities. And also assess whether there may be a need, but is enhancing cross-border cooperation, is it a better alternative than trying to address the development challenges through other means? Second, the tool has helped to, to, by providing concrete recommendations and considerations, it aims to, to help policymakers design, implement, monitor, and evaluate uh, planning documents that can guide cross-border action. And not only focus on the, on the, on the design of cross-border strategic planning, but also make sure that those are effectively implemented and that it is learning from implementation. The tool also aims to, to ensure that there's sustainable and adaptable funding and financing for cross-border bodies and cross-border actions. And finally, the objective is to, to help policymakers effectively promote and uh, advocate for cross-border needs to be met. For all this, we build on a number of elements. First three elements that you see outlined here, they relate to the project. We build on the knowledge and the experiences that have been shared by the five pilot regions, but we also really build on, on documents, on studies, on manuals that have already been developed. We are not the first actor to be acting in this field. We build on, um, on what La Motte, on what the European Commission, what ESPON, what the Committee of the Regions, of, uh, the Council of Europe have already developed to try to make sure that the final version of this tool, I said today we're discussing a preliminary version, is as reflective as possible of the body of knowledge that is out there and your experiences and those of other regions to, to make sure that we are not in sort of having overlapping or competing documents, but to make sure that we refer to each other. Then let's come to the, fin finally, uh, to the cross-border governance framework. So there's a lot going on in this slide, but first I would like to just walk you through the three, the, the, four, the four dimensions. The first dimension, it looks at establishing and reinforcing cross-border gov gov cross governance bodies, to really focusing on sort of the institutionalization. The second uh, dimension, it looks at planning, implementation, monitoring, and evaluation. So going from strategic planning, identification of strategic planning needs, to the implementation either through cross-border networking or brokerage activities, the provision of a cross-border service delivery to monitoring and evaluation of the performance of an EGTC, of uh, the delivery of a, of a, of a specific service. And then we move into uh, funding and financing for, again, cross-border bodies and actions, and finally promoting and advocating for cross-border development. Each of those dimensions is composed of different development areas. So for example, the first one, it looks at, here the objective is, or the objective that is proposed in, uh, in, the, in the preliminary tool, it is about coming together as public and non-governmental actors to try to identify 
and develop a shared understanding of what is the need for enhanced cross-border cooperation, what are the opportunities for enhanced cross-border collaboration. Because cross-border challenges are difficult to address, they are not solved overnight. And because cross-border governance bodies are not established and operational within one year or two, uh, it is really important to have a common understanding and a shared agreement on what are the, the mid and long term objectives that we are achieving, especially as you'll be working with, you're working with different administrations. When there's new politicians coming in, it is important to, to already have a sound basis and an understanding about what are we doing here. Then we move to the establishment of cross-border bodies, the identification of, okay, we have a common, common understanding. What is the governance body that best helps us? There are the EGTCs, but there are also other cooperation bodies and models out there that can be considered. What are the human resources and the financial resources that we have available to make this work, not only to establish it, but to make sure that it is, continues to operate and deliver results? There are also legal requirements, for example, for the, the, the creation of the EGTC that, that should be considered. That brings me to the third development area, setting up internal governance structures, uh, decision-making and multi-stakeholder participation. Um, as, as stated, the EGTC regulations mandate the creation, I think, of a, a, a representative body, uh, but there are also other bodies that can support the implementation. We're thinking, for example, a technical secretariat, uh, multi-actor or working groups. Uh, here, it is this, this development area really looks at who has a voice, who doesn't have a voice, who takes decisions, how are decisions taken, um, what are the, 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 the resources that we have available to make these bodies work? Because what often happens is five bodies are created, but then perhaps after five years you, you realize that the consultative body has only met once. So were, was, was it... Um, mm. Make sure that when these bodies are set up, that the analysis is sound to make sure that they can really have added value not only for the EGTC or another cross-border body as such, but also to their different participants. That brings me to the second dimension. Here, as stated, we look at cross-border strategic planning, clearly identifying what are our strategic planning needs, which are different for different regions, depending on the strategic objectives of, co of cooperating regions, depending on how many strategic plans are already out there uh, in order not to overburden policymakers with yet another strategic plan. So the tool provides considerations for that. It also provides considerations for what to consider for, for the design of a strategic plan in terms of a diagnostic, in terms of results framework, in terms of ensuring that in the design implementation is really considered uh, in order to help move from strategic objectives to actual implementation. This pillar also looks at, we identify sort of as two streams of the operation. It is cross-border brokerage and networking between actors, between projects, information, um, and at cross-border public service delivery. And finally, this, uh, this dimension looks at cross-border monitoring and evaluation, looks at what are, what, are we, what are our monitoring and evaluation objectives? What are the objects? What are we monitoring? Is it a strategic development plan? Is it integrated service delivery? Is it uh, cross-border data? Uh, for example, on, on pollution and congestion, et cetera. Uh, it also looks, for example, it, it includes considerations on the creation of cross-border observatories to meet that need. Then we move to funding and financing. These are relatively self-explicable, but the tool provides a series of recommendations or, or considerations on when you are setting up an EGTC or a different body, what are some decisions that could be taken to make sure that funding for the EGTC, for the cross-border cooperation body, is adaptable to changing needs? Or what happens if there are new members coming in, or members leave, or uh, to make sure that the funding model changes with changing circumstances? And it also looks at funding and financing for action, and specifically the tool identifies uh, a wide range of funding opportunities, funding programs, not only Interreg, there's a world beyond Interreg, uh, identifying, including the uh, considerations for mobilizing funding from the private sector uh, through shared investment funds, etc. And finally, we come to cross-border promotion and advocacy. Here, we look at not generating 
political support to establish an EGTC or a different cross-border body, but how to maintain it in the face of frequent political turnover, for example, or in the face of new challenges that arise that need to political attention, perhaps from the national level. How do you get them to pay attention to what is happening and act locally? And finally, it looks at cross-border promotion. So here, we're, for example, we're talking about what regions, cross-border regions can do to make a region more attractive to, to tourists, to identify and share a shared or, 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 or different cultural, natural uh, history and environment, uh, attractive for, for cross-border residents themselves, to identify what are the cross-border services and goods that are on offer, so that on one side of the border people know that they don't have to travel to the capital to, to study, but they can also travel 20 miles to the other side of the border, because there is also an excellent university. Um, this particularly brings me to the, uh, reminds me of the Rio Minho experience. Um, but also cross-border, uh, increasing the attractiveness for external investment. How do you make sure that the region is not in competition among itself for attracting investment, but you attract, you, you share your, uh, it's about positioning and sharing your sort of shared uh, value added for external investors. So, what does the two include and how does it work? We already went over the four dimensions. The 11 development areas already covered. For each of the development areas, we propose a series of actions, broad actions, and those are further broken down into considerations. And they are considerations. They are not, this is not a, a, a force suit. Um, because this tool needs to be flexible and adaptable to meet different contexts. Because cross-border collaboration in Rio Minho is very different uh, from uh, Niemen in, in, in Poland. Um, so, what does it do? The, or what, what, how does it help? The cross-border governance tool, it serves as a self-assessment checklist or a conversation starter. It, can, it provides the, the, the tool and the, and the mechanism or the framework, they provide flexibility. That means that cross-border regions can apply different elements of it. It's not a document that needs to be worked through or can be worked through perhaps from one to Z. But cross-border regions that are in their establishment phases can pick up or perhaps focus mainly on, on the first dimension. There may be other cross-border regions that are particularly interested in trying to increase the diversification of resources to fund projects. So there is a se separate element for that. We included check and comment boxes to make it more manageable for policymakers to identify which actions have already been taken, what is the status, uh, or, or of implementation, or what are some additional challenges uh, or considerations or discussions that need to be had. And finally, this tool should not be conceived, viewed, or used as prescriptive or one-size-fits-all template. It is meant to be adapted, as I said, a conversation starter to help policymakers uh, address the challenges they are facing uh, in their territories. Just a practical example here. Uh, this is a bit what, uh, what the tool looks like. So we're talking here about the mention to funding and financing cross-border bodies and actions. In particular, we're talking about cross-border actions. And we have a few actions and recommendations highlighted here. Um, well, later today, we have a session on funding and financing, so I don't want to uh, spend too much time on this. Then today's event. We'll, today, we have three different elements. We'll start with a panel on cross-border strategies, strategic and spatial planning, uh, in which we have three representatives providing presentations. We have EGTC Rio Minho, the EGTC Alzet Beleval, and we have uh, a contribution from the Central European Support Service for uh, cross-border initiatives. This is followed by a panel discussion on cross-border public service delivery, which are presentations from the EGT Cerdanya Hospital and from experts from Spatial Foresight. And then in the, in the evening afternoon, we, we move to cross-border funding of bodies and actions. And then finally, at six, from six to eight, we have a networking dinner. Then tomorrow, there are only two elements. It is a final panel discussion on uh, enhancing political support for cross-border cooperation. This is followed by a workshop. And the workshop is, is meant to give an opportunity to share your thoughts on this tool about elements that you think are missing 
or putting yourself in the shoes of the director of your EDDC or your colleagues or the national ministry, what could they use, what could they, may they want to have in this tool that is currently not there? The, really the objective is to make it as practical and make it as realistic and, and useful to policymakers. And for that, you may have seen on your desk uh, a document. Um, the document serves as input for, for tomorrow. We have taken different par parts, different elements of the tool, um, that one, give you a little peek of how the tool, the preliminary version of the tool, how it is structured. Um, we would very much like to ask if you have comments to please share them with them, with us, either on the on the on the format, or during private conversations, or do, and during tomorrow's workshop, to make sure that we represent your wealth of knowledge and your experiences. The the formats they indicate, the templates indicate uh, which group hopefully you will be able to work with us in for tomorrow's workshop. Um, if you have to leave early. Uh, today, and you may want to leave a few comments with us, please feel free to, to share the document with us. Um, then a final word in terms of next steps. As, uh, as Dorothea already alluded to, after today's event, we will work on processing your comments, your suggestions, that can also obviously be shared afterwards during calls, during, during meetings, etc. And to really to make this document, I repeat it, as useful as possible to you and your colleagues. Um, we'll be organizing an international dialogue event in November to open the discussion to not only focus on EU cross-border regions, but also non-EU OECD members uh, to learn about their experiences and to see what elements, for example, of this tool and of your work are relevant for them and what experiences they have working in very different contexts that can be useful in terms of service they're leaving, in terms of funding and financing, collaboration with private sector that can be useful for European cross-border regions. And finally, in December, we, we publish a synthesis report that reflects on this collaboration, issues, analysis, and recommendations, not only for national, regional, and local policymakers, but also has some reflections for the European Commission, eventually. And it will include a final version of this tool. And in parallel track, just to mention, each of the five regions, for, for them, we're working on a, a practical blueprint uh, for their regions only. Um, in principle, those will be finished in uh, uh, over August and September. And that is it. With 38 seconds to go. Great. <laughs> just to check where we are on the agenda. Sabrina. Perhaps first, before we open the, the panel discussion, are there any questions or concerns or comments or elements that you would like to, to share before we move to different presentations and hearing from your, from your colleagues? It was a lot to take in. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Stefan, very much. I will try to break this down for into smaller bite-sized pieces so we can maybe get into discussions about that. Um, we are going to move into our first panel discussion. Um, I think what I'll do is I'll just give, a, I'll set the scene a little bit with a very brief presentation on uh, going a little bit more in depth into the cross-border strategies and spatial planning dimension of the framework and the tool, and then I will invite our speakers uh, to join me up on the stage and we will uh, start our discussion. So, let's see. In theory it works. Uh, well, okay. 
Uh, I'm going to come back to this. Sorry. We're going to. Okay. Hang on a second. There should be a presentation to show up. Ah, uh, uh, voila. Okay, good. Um, so, what I'd like to do is first share this, this, uh, this particular dimension. It's the strategic and spatial planning for cross-border development dimension. Uh, and get into, to start by getting into why this is important. Why does strategic planning uh, for cross-border cooperation matter? And it matters for, for a number of reasons. First of all, any strategy is really a roadmap for action. It helps identify where you want to go, uh, and particularly in this case, where you want to go as a cross-border region. It also helps set your objectives, so you know where you're going. But a plan and a strategic plan also helps guides helps to guide resources. And I want to be very clear about resources for a moment, because resources on the obvious are financial resources, and also human, human resources. Um, so a strategy can, you know, as you know, help figure out where you're going to channel funds and where you're going to put your human, your human capital. But also, infrastructure, equipment are resources. So do you have, is there the space? And the other one that I really want to highlight, because it's an important resource and we forget about it, or we don't consider it a resource, is time. And time is becoming an even more scarce resource. So we need to think about cross-border uh, cooperation and how long it's going to take to implement and see results, and what you need in terms of the human capacity and the financial capacity over time. A strategy is going to help with benchmarking. It's going to help help you as in a cross-border region identify if you're reaching your objectives, but with the appropriate data, it can also show how you have been improving and how the, the economy, the social conditions, or the, the quality of life in a cross-border region improves, and how it may be performing with respect to other regions in the country or in both countries. Um, it is also a point of reference for engagement and partnership and investment in terms of um, helping Helping actors, both and especially political actors, uh, but also the private sector and citizens, identify where they can contribute to a cross-border uh, economy or where they can contribute to a cross-border culture and common shared identity. Uh, and then a strategy also will help with Establishing clear communications of, in, of, of where you want to go and of your objectives. Once, once you know where you want to get to, it's easier to say that and, and what you need to do in order to get there. So this also gives a shared understanding of purpose of the cross-border cooperation and what it's going to take to accomplish it and who may be best placed to help you accomplish it. There are, however, some very critical elements in the, in the strategy dimension of cross-border cooperation. And I won't go through all, all of them, but I would like to highlight a couple of them. One is the value added. Um, and here, what we mean by this is, does creating a strategy for cross-border cooperation on its own provide a value added to what you want to do. And I, I think that sounds a little bit heretical, because we will always think, oh, yeah, no, you always need a strategy. Well, you do. But you don't need too many strategies at the same time, because then it's very hard to prioritize. So the question here is, will a standalone strategy for cross-border development be helpful to you 
And is that what you need? And is that going to be a helpful tool, not only for your objectives and as a, as a cross-border entity or policymaker? Or is it better and more appropriate to look at existing documents and see how those align with your objectives and base yourselves on those? These are questions that we cannot answer for you, but we can give some uh, hints and ideas which are in the tool. Um, and then it's a question, as I said, of alignment and prioritization. Resources, as we've been talking about, are another key, key element to consider. So instead of throwing yourself into moving forward, think about the resources that you're going to need beforehand. And implementation. And implementation is also a fundamental aspect here in terms of critical elements for policymakers to consider. And I frequently say you can have the most elegant strategy in the world, but if you do not have the resources to implement, and if you do not have a plan to implement, then your strategy won't get anywhere. And if you don't implement, and implementation is much harder than strategy development. Um, so is there the implementation capacity and the will and commitment to implement? Uh, financing, and finally measurement. And measurement is often forgotten or not thought of ex ante. Measurement needs to be thought of ex ante in order to know what you're measuring, how you're going to measure it, do you have the capacity to do it, are other entities willing to give you the information you need? So these are some of the elements to consider when thinking about the strategy dimension or the strategic planning dimension for cross-border cooperation. And what we've seen in the, in the project is that regions have diverse approaches to strategic planning. On the one hand, some of them uh, focus on delivering specific projects but are not necessarily based on a, a broader strategic uh, document. That can work. It can be a little bit short term or medium term in its, in its approach and not long term, but that's a choice. Some regions may have an integrated cross-border strategy. So, I mean, these are two ends of a spectrum. And finally, and this isn't in the middle, it's just another thing that needs to be considered, is that not only do you need a strategy or is it worth thinking about a strategy for the development of your cross-border region, it's also relevant to think about a strategy for the development of your cross-border organization and your cross-border body. Because as an entity, you also need to think about where you want to go and what your objectives are and how you may want to grow. And that needs to be done in partnership with the different cross-border collaborators. So, you know, on both sides of the border, if you have three borders, you know, all of those. Where, where do you want to go, and how can you mutually support each other to get there? We've also saw, found some very common strategic planning challenges. In human resources, what we noticed was that, or what regions told us, was that uh, there can be a shortage of human resources which hampers uh, strategy design, and that can hinder implementation. And in terms of the human resources, it can be in terms of the number of people, or it can also be in terms of the skill set. So sometimes you have the staff, but they don't have the skills. Funding and uh, implementation. So cross-border strategy sometimes don't have, they're not providing enough guidance as to where you want to go and how to prioritize in order to channel funds. Monitoring and evaluation is another challenge. Um, 
and often the approach that cross-border regions are taking to monitoring and evaluation isn't very clear, which then makes it much more difficult to know if you're meeting your objectives or if your programs are working or if your services are bringing the results that they need to for the region. And finally, sometimes there's a duplication of planning efforts. Um, when there are lots, when you have a, a cross-border plan and a national plan and a local plan and a regional plan, there's, there can be overlap. Um, and so that will limit the incentive for a cross-border strategy. As I said earlier, it may not be a bad thing, but then things really need to align. Um, and so there's a, there's a need to balance different strat strategic planning documents. So what the tool does is it identifies a series of actions that can help cross-border partners strengthen their strategic planning practices. And so what we've done here is um, really we're focusing on the strategic planning and on the monitoring and evaluation sort of as an example. If you look at the tool, it's much, it's much broader. And the point here is first you to define the strategic planning needs and the capacities. And this really needs to be done in collaboration with the, the cross-border uh, partners, with the entities that are going to establish or have established the, the, um, the cross-border body, the EGTC uh, in this case. Um, Create, that leads you to creating a planning document, which then needs to be communicated uh, to key audiences. And in key audiences, certainly a political level, certainly the private sector, because they're, they're partners, and definitely to uh, the communities and citizens. In fact, because they are the ones that are supposed to be benefiting from this, so it's also important to know how they're going to, what they need in order to feel that they have benefited. Converting objectives into concrete actions and plans. And we're getting very much into action plans, but again, that goes to the implementation. So just having the strategy is not enough. Knowing how that strategy is going to come into play and knowing what needs to be done and who needs to be involved in order to get there and in what amount of time is, is just as important so you can move things forward. Um, Supporting the strategic planning activities of relevant public bodies is another key point. Establishing the monitoring and evaluation framework, as I mentioned, and really, really importantly, is learning. And it's learning from what is being done and learning from the implementation processes, and not just learning, but translating that learning into future action and into adjustments as they need to be made. And now I would like to invite our panelists to join me here um, for a discussion about cross-border strategies and strategic planning. So if um, Mr. Gines Olivier or, Ol Olivier or Oliver, uh, tech Oliver, technical secretary from the EGTC of Rio Minho uh, in Portugal and Spain, if, if uh, Gines, you would like to come join us. Also Nathan Ball, from is a project manager at the EGTC Alzette Belval in uh, France and Luxembourg. And um, Mr. Jula Otskoy. Great, okay, that was not easy. Uh, Secretary General of the Central European Support Service for Cross-Border Initiatives. If you can please join us. And I would like to launch this discussion um, really focusing on the, the strategy and strategic planning for cross-border, we have um, Hines and Nathan who were part of this project, so we will be hearing from them and their experience, and I believe you both have presentations. I think all three of you have presentations. So perhaps, Hines, if you would like to take the floor and... Um, <clears throat> Thank you very much. I'm really humbled by the quality of the analysis and, uh, and you will f immediately understand why. Because this is rocket science, beautifully expressed, and then I'm coming with a broken motorcycle. <laughs> uh, 
But uh, my, my only point, because I had to abide by the invitation, is that this, this could help to see some boundaries, some limits, some frontiers in the EGTC concept and in the CBC, cross-border cooperation concept. I think those are European Union boundaries, and they are very serious uh, political boundaries, but I would like to your opinion. Before that, I'm, I can be very boring, but uh, I can also. <laughs> Let me express my gratitude for the wonderful design of the European Union we are enjoying, and sometimes we're not, I think, entirely aware of it, and and this will make sense in my presentation as well. You will see. It's been in my fashat for three years. Slava Ukraine. Okay. So, let's go ahead. Fine. You're all invited. Some, I know I have the pleasure of knowing some of you from Paris or past uh, meetings. You are all invited to a wonderful place. Landscape and people are really wonderful. Uh, this is the Minho River, that is a border between uh, Portugal and Spain in its last uh, 70, 80 kilometers. Now, if I can recap very briefly what I said in Paris, because at that time, at that time I felt that we were all different, but uh, Rio Minho ETC could be a little more different than the others. Uh, I said, and I has, as I have repeated now, I think it's very important to to value and, and preserve the tenets of the European Union. Number two, we were not particularly bad in terms of advocacy and fundraising compared to other colleagues on EUTCs. Number three, uh, we always see there is an amazing capacity, this time on the OECD colleagues and consultants, but certainly in the Euregio and in uh, the European Union working on CBC. Uh, Number three, I'd like to remember something that my beloved Elisa Ferreira said in one meeting a year and a half ago, which is that uh, when you are really concerned about CBC, you realize that money is important, but it's not always the only thing, and not even the most important. It's not mostly about money sometimes. Ingenuity and goodwill can really make a lot, convey a lot. And finally, I make some analysis. I will just move into that, saying that we might have some, could be national, money sometimes. The example I will go for 20 seconds, no more on this, is that in Galicia, in the northern part of our region, of our Portuguese Spanish region, we have three airports. They're struggling to have one million passengers per year. They cannot compete as of today with a wonderful hub that has emerged over the last 20 years, that is the Porto Airport. And the Porto Airport use its success to very good work on their side, but also to the fact that we have invested 100 million euros, sorry, 1,000 million, 1 billion uh, euros into three different airports when we should have uh, made some strategic planning, by the way. Uh, good Socrates thought that when one is a virtuous person, immediately that person will be acting. One is wise, well-informed, knows himself, herself. Uh, that person will act always in the right manner. I'm not so sure about that. And from a political science or managerial perspective, I will emphasize that even good architecture is not enough sometimes. In any case, please do not drink a cicuta out of a very courteous or distinguished position. The soft version of what I'm going to say, of what I'm already saying, is this. Culture eats a strategy for breakfast. It comes. It is believed to come from a very distinguished analyst in strategy. I was lecturing strategy years ago. Uh, then I became even more boring, becoming consultant in 40 countries around the world. Uh, Peter Drucker is a wonderful source of inspiration, even today, uh, after his work, main work happened 30, 40 years ago. And the point, as you can imagine, is, and has been mentioned by our good uh, OECD consultants, is that a strategy itself needs implementation. And then that implementation will be facing the context of the organizational culture, 
of uh, local willingness of resources. Fine. We have, I have been said, uh, Stefan has been <laughs> vocal about that. We have a very good new strategy. It's a renewed version of our previous strategy. I am not so much in love with it, and there are a number of reasons. One of them is that, okay, that's just a small example. We have a collection of probably 50 strategies in our archives, okay? From the last six, seven years, no more, okay? Strategies are extremely common in our local world, okay? Then I was very happy to hear now that the tool will, uh, will help making all those strategies, simplifying that jungle of different uh, local, regional, national, uh, topic, uh, area, strategies, because really, we really have plenty of them. Okay, because uh, you can have a, as many cathedrals as you want in a, in, in a city. Let me get my notes, for a second. Provided you don't have, which is the reason for a cathedral to be there, a bishop of the same denomination in each of those cathedrals, because they cannot coexist in the same territory. Uh, if they are true strategies, they will be colliding one with each other. And that's a little uh, situation we are facing. Incidentally, no problem in the, <laughs> thank you. Incidentally, uh, the rationale, the motivation for the strategy that we uh, renewed uh, last year and the year before was very, very pragmatic. We wanted to have a credential to go with our new strategy to some calls for some tenders in coming occasions, okay? I'm not sure that we are really, really uh, enlightened operators that really want to have a better, more modern strategy. Um, and the problem, the reason for those many strategies, I, I've been wondering a little, I think it's partially that it's uh, the, the, the production of those strategies is supply driven. We have very good consulting firms, and they're always ready to assist and, and provide that. But it's also that we all, and our representatives certainly also, like to feel they're doing something new uh, that you can define as Adanism, <clears throat> feeling you are creating the world, you have been the first one in the new created, newly created world. Uh, and then the happiness of launching it and toasting and saying, hey, from now on, things will be different. Usually, in my experience, in my local experience, which is what I'm trying to convey, um, we, we never look at those strategies again, <laughs> or nearly, in the coming two, three, four, five years, and then, by then, we will have a new strategy somewhere. Uh, incentives, I think you know, or many of you might know, uh, a wonderful situation in colonial India when the British Empire was paying people to bring bounties, to bring uh, cobras, okay? And for a while, because cobras were a threat to, to people, for a while the population of cobras diminished as they were chased and, and brought. But shortly after, very shortly after, people were farming cobras <laughs> in order to bring them and get money and get the bounty, okay? And then the British Empire authorities said, hey, 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 no longer, we'll pay no more for these cobras you are bringing because they were not, you know, wild local cobras. You were having them in your farms. And then the population of cobras multiplied because people said, oh, okay, fine, we just leave them, okay? Sometimes we have a bit of that situation with the, uh, with the strategies in our, in our past. Okay, let me refer now, and I think I should be moving forward as quick as possible to a few examples of our situation, which is not entirely nice, as you will see. For instance, how does the new strategy we have, hey, let's take advantage of it, uh, work in a couple of examples here. Uh, sustainable mobility is one of the topics or areas that has a priority in the, in the strategy, okay? Incidentally, we had a B Solutions case. I think Ricardo is uh, not here this moment. Uh, 
uh, that was uh, how to deal with VAT in municipalities on an e-bikes exchange scheme. Okay, the, the document was produced by a legal advisor, pretty good incidentally, but, but for some political reasons, the document was never distributed to the people who should be receiving it, number one. The document was never presented. There was never a presentation, a public presentation of the document. Number three, the document should be sent to the tax and uh, excise authority to see with a binding, uh, asking for a binding opinion to see how that could change regulations on the Spanish and Portuguese uh, tax authorities. It was never done at all. And in the summary I, I got, someone said, yeah, but look, there's no problem because e-bikes, after only 10 months, not even stopped working because of some problems we had, we should have been claiming or even suing the company. The majors said, please do it, EGTC. EGTC didn't do it for a year. Never a good explanation for that. So now there are no bikes, there are no invoices, there are no, no VAT. There are invoices that should be billing uh, municipalities which are asking for them and we are not producing them. It's a mystery, somehow. There's another example which is a fine new uh, European economic interest grouping uh, by the name of Mercatus. Uh, brilliant people, we are working hand in hand. We have a wonderful relation with them. Uh, two minutes, I said, okay, thank you. And um, uh, I was said that they would be implementing something of us. It was the other way around. We were giving them fake instructions. You should, they should not be doing a presentation, which wasn't true. Uh, we were told uh, things about them that were not true either, serious things, damaging things. And finally, they were told, I think this could be funny, not many things funny from now on. They were told that the European Union was forbidding hybrid presentations. <laughs> you know, streaming and people around. That is forbidden by European Union. You cannot do that. I was <laughs> researching, and of course, that was not the case. And that was hybrid presentation was a good way of increasing the impact. Fine. Even more, in, more direct impact. Um, yeah, in recruitment. After the strategy, we recruited a project manager, but uh, the terms of reference were very peculiar. Uh, uh, preparation of draft uh, projects or proposals for grants was eliminated, and then project uh, management or monitoring or project supervision was changed by project escorting. No, no pun intended here, okay? And while we had 30 candidates, good candidates for these uh, project manager positions in the past, for this one we only had one person who had no experience whatsoever before, who had a very cozy relation with some of our people, by the way, and she was hired, of course. Number two, I mean, that is in direct contradiction with any strategy that you have done with a little care. Number two, internal organization. Uh, our, we have two project managers. They have no portfolio. There is no organization as such. If you want to think about matrix arrangements, teamwork, and things like that, no, come on, no. The best you can hear, because the work of one of these person is enigmatic, even for the person sitting two meters from her, is that they are duplicating each other. Doesn't make any sense at all, but that's what we hear. And then something that I find very serious in a European, uh, in a e EGTC, which is that for some reason that uh, should change as soon, as soon as possible, there is a veto. Only people with a Portuguese passport can work with Portuguese institutions, and only people with Spanish passport can work with Spanish institutions. Uh, I, I cannot express how ridiculous this seems to me, and how damaging for the very idea of a GTC and European activity. Now, someone could say, okay, but how is your architecture? And I'm sorry that, uh, in, in some way, I'm sorry that Ricardo is not here, because he was very, uh, oh, Ricardo, oh, I, I, I'm also sorry that you are here, Ricardo, as, as you will realize now. Ricardo said to me, you have a wonderful architecture in your GTC, and he, he was, he, I mean, he, he went forward. He said, look, uh, do you have a stable secretariat which is collegial and has people from both nationalities? 
that is very good because that is the working engine that will be non-stop there even if there is political change. Okay, and then we have an alternating executive director that stays for two years. Two years a Portuguese gentleman or lady and two years a Galician lady or gentleman. I will be rushing now. Uh, sure, sure. No, no. Um, but, okay, now we go into the red uh, <laughs> ink. Uh, the, the, I, I arrived in September. I am waiting for a proper meeting of the secretariat. I'm working five days a week there. Actually, I'm working six or seven weeks, uh, days a week. Uh, my, my colleague has always refused to meet, okay? Is this serious? No, this is just uh, criminal, I think. Um, at the same time, my, my, the director arrived a little before uh, following uh, Spanish local elections, and he has never, even before I arrived, he has never been supported by my colleague, and certainly neither by the secretariat. Is this uh, acceptable? I don't think so at all. Now, I'm rushing now. If you give me just one minute, 20 seconds. How complex is this, and do we need it to go for very serious analysis? Not really. This is 2010, this is Iraq, and New York Times said, okay, we have met our enemy in Iraq, and it is a PowerPoint, because this, come on, you cannot try to understand the world when you go into so many. Uh, go for the Ockham Razor, please, okay? And here, the Ockham Razor points to, um, unfortunately, uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry to say this, to deception. Uh, in one meeting in October, our director in, in a meeting of the board was very, very serious, saying that deception had to finish. It hasn't. Okay? Now, this is fully legal. I want to, 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 to um, underline this. Uh, uh, this, is, this is the group, uh, Union do Povo Galego, uh, Galician People's uh, Union. This is the political party that was uh, riding the show to a large extent in the EGTC until July last year for the last, for the previous two years, okay? They are against uh, not only NATO, also against the European Union, and they are uh, against Spain. They want independence and they want to, I think it's reasonable to say they want some sort of a Venezuela or Cuba in, in Spain, okay? Uh, and it is fully legal and I fully respect that. So far, okay. The problem is that we have some very, very dangerous uh, power games crossing the river by which uh, our colleague is not accepting the result of the elections. Incidentally, these people only had 10% uh, of the vote, no more. And they, I don't think they should be compared with who had 40% uh, of the vote or 50% of the vote. Yeah, we, need we need to wrap up. I will rush now. I'm Okay, so what is the actual value of a good, what is the actual impact of a good strategy? Okay, I think we have some prerequisites. This is very uncommon. Thanks God it doesn't happen in every GTC. I haven't seen this in 40 years in my life in uh, ever so many countries of Asia, Africa, Middle East, uh, uh, former Yugoslavia, South America, etc. Okay, is democracy the only game in town here? No, not at all, unfortunately not. Is rule of law considered an actual rule here? No, it is not, very serious. Okay, how much sabotage, actually hybrid war, can international public organizations endure? And I think European Union is one of them, incidentally. Uh, how can we uh, preserve European Union tenets, principles, key principles from local quid pro quo? Fine, uh, I think it's, it's, it's a sad paradox that organizations like EGTC can be used to establish enclaves and impunity. And just this is the last, nearly the last one. Uh, there is a so-called Bertrand Russell paradox, which is you cannot be uh, tolerant with those who are intolerant, who don't respect the rules, okay? I wish we could be thinking more strategically and I really appreciate and admire the work that you have been doing Okay, and if we could only work more with wonderful colleagues we have, it would be a pleasure. And that's it. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, I think this is on. Thank you very much, Jimenez. 
Uh, that's okay. Thank you for sharing your experience and your perspectives on um, strategic planning and the, the, the kind of future of, of cross-border regions. Um, Nathan, would you like to join us, please, and uh, tell us a little bit more about your experience in um, Alzette Belval? Yes, so uh, first of all, I want to apologize because I will be the first to break the sacred rule to speak in English. Uh, first, uh, because I do not want to commit a murder on the beautiful Shakespeare language. And uh, also, because if I want to keep my promise to respect the 10 minutes time bank, uh, it will be better for me to do it in French. Um, keep an eye on the clock. Okay. I'm just... <laughs> my fault anyway. No. Um, le territoire... So in our project, it's not just one structure. Uh, actually, we are three structures, uh, uh, EGCT, Alzette, Belfa, uh, Pôle Métropolitain Frontalier, and ProSud, which are more uh, national structures, but as you can see it here, they are intertwined. So it's a bit like a, a Lego game, which can complement one another, uh, uh, considering the project considering the plan, considering the territory. So the territory is uh, quite specific in our case because, as you can see it on the map, it's really at the heart of Europe. I would even say it's at the heart, located at the heart of the six founding countries of the European Union. And at local level, uh, the territory is located at... Uh, three borders where three countries meet. On the east, we have a, a triple uh, border, uh, Germany, Luxembourg, uh, and uh, the Netherlands, and then we have Belgium, France, and Luxembourg on the other hand. So this is uh, at the a crossroad of Schengen. Uh, this is the area of Alzette Belval uh, between France and Luxembourg. So the idea was born uh, between 2010 and 2013. It was really born in 2013. We just celebrated 10 years last year. It covers 13 towns or municipalities. Uh, and it covers about 106,000 inhabitants and 147 square meters. We have a general assembly, which is a joint assembly. Uh, so we have equal voting between France and Luxembourg, uh, a rotating uh, presidency. Uh, so we rotate between France and Luxembourg. This year it's France. As of March next year, it will be uh, president from Luxembourg. And then there is a team, and I'm part of this team. The team is dedicated to uh, the strategic uh, directions which have been decided for a period of time. And this time, it's until 2027. What are the various uh, themes that were supported? Uh, healthcare, mobility, soft mobility, and public transport in this case, living together project, uh, sustainable development, environment, spatial planning, educational cooperation, and uh, leisure, leisure time. And then uh, to make our area, the totem, uh, the symbol of what can be done in terms of cooperation between France and Luxembourg. The uh, Pôle Métropolitain Frontalier, uh, Marie is here to correct me if I'm wrong. The pole was created in 2019. It is a Franco-French structure, actually, the aim of which is to represent the municipalities and their interaction all of the municipalities that interact with Luxembourg. We're talking about 150 municipalities for 340 inhabitants. And now the specificity is that 70% of the French nationals who um, work in Luxembourg live here in this area. So we focus on four specific topics, mobility, but here it's 
uh, we focus also on mobility infrastructure, economic development and culture, healthcare and public services, and then higher education and professional training, vocational training. In uh, 2019, uh, the uh, Pôle Métropolitain, PMF, had uh, a light version of a strategy, but it changed because it was disrupted by changes in uh, the governance and also the PMF represents the interest of these uh, inter uh, municipality uh, structures. So there is a window of opportunity to discuss between the French and the Luxembourg government. So rather than uh, having a comprehensive strategy, PMF is developing an action uh, plan. Gail will correct me if I'm not speaking the truth here when talking about ProSud. It's more or less the equivalent of a PMF, but the idea here is to gather all of the southern municipalities of uh, southern Luxembourg. We're talking about uh, uh, about uh, 50,000 cross-border workers, 180,000 citizens, 200 square kilometers, and we have a UNESCO Biosphere Reserve and a number of strategic priorities, such as um, spatial or territorial development, an, a regional energy plan, eco-mobility, education to environment, and uh, cross-border collaboration between France and Luxembourg on all of these topics. So why did we register the three of us with the Commission and the OECD. Why a three-partner submission? Well, first of all, because we wanted to have a functional area. Uh, uh, we also have a functional interreg area, and we wanted to solve most of the challenges that we were exper experiencing at the borders. The border there is one of the most dynamic cross-boundary uh, area. We have no obstacles, actually, and uh, we are well in advance in as far as uh, the labor market is concerned, mobility, and many other subjects, actually. And then uh, there was the idea that we all have our own strategy and, uh, and action plans, but we all focus on mobility and uh, uh, territorial development. So let me get to some of the themes that I'm well familiar with. So I'm focusing on the EGTC Alzette Belval strategy. So the idea here was to try to stabilize our uh, longer term strategies, so beyond the six years, but this was supposed to be also a sort of a guideline to move forward with our project. We didn't want to have just a long-term project, but we wanted to have shorter-term actions. This sort of roadmap, a strategic roadmap, allowed us to link with other programs or other structures who needed to know where we came from, where we were going, and so we can interact with, um, we can interact with Interreg, but also with the national level uh, in Luxembourg and in France. It allows us to have a better coordinated action amongst the partners, the municipalities, the département in France and the communes in Luxembourg. And it's also an advantage when you wish to have uh, plans for an interreg area. Um, you need to fund 
the structures, you need to fund the project. And so with this strategy and with the interreg structure, you have all that. So how do you come up with a strategy? Well, first of all, you start with shorter periods of time. So you start by setting uh, short-term objectives. That's what we did between 2014 and 2016. Then on the basis of that, between 2017 and 2020, we refocused and uh, we uh, fine-tuned. And once we uh, agreed on that, we wanted a, a longer-term uh, uh, vision. And we wanted to open it to new themes rather than uh, dispersing uh, too much. So about the spatial planning, what was the strategy? So how did we come up with a six-year roadmap? We've been gravitating around this objective since 2014. We wanted to think and plan together a more resilient future for the neighbors. So, you know, uh, sometimes the border is simply uh, a house, a property. You can't tell the difference uh, unless you've decided one day until here it's France, up from there on, it will be Luxembourg. So territory is a tool to promote and defend, uphold the interest of Alzette Belval at all levels between France and Luxembourg. So the first step in 2020 was to come up with a sort of uh, diagram of all the things that could be done, that could be done better, that could be developed on the territory. We had five axes. Normally, this map I have in my office, and it's much larger and much clearer. So the idea is to have urban reinforcement so that there is equity coordination. We want urban development. We want a proper balance between uh, what is built and what is uh, landscape. Then in 2021, uh, we had a first recognition of the mapping work that had been uh, conducted. So the idea that was that the greater region and the capital of Luxembourg was taking into account what was happening all around the capital. So we considered the Grande Région, the greater region, as a whole. And we decided to develop the territories at cross-border level. And then we, uh, since 2020, we went further for greater operationality. So ever since 2021, we realized that we weren't that successful we had a large project, architectural project, between France and Luxembourg. Then COVID hit. And uh, then there was an interreg project with the ACT project, uh, Citizens for the Ecological Transitions. So the idea here was to uh, move a step further in the direction of a Europe or an area for the citizens with the citizens. So we felt the um, border was something artificial, artific artificially designed, arbitrarily designed also. So we wanted to coordinate urban projects so to achieve better coordination. And in 2024, the Intergovernmental Committee will start thinking about uh, town development together. So that's it. Thank you for your attention. Et merci aussi pour uh, souligner ce concept de un plan. Thank you uh, very much for underlining the need for a, strategic, for a strategy, but also for a strategic plan. 
now to, um, to our next speaker, uh, Mr. Jula Otskoy. Um, please. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for this uh, kind invitation and the opportunity to share with you uh, some hints over our uh, methodology that we are using at the SESCI uh, Association for drafting cross-border integrated strategic plans. It is uh, mission impossible to uh, give you the whole comprehensive picture on this methodology, but I try to do my best to uh, give you a summary in 10 minutes. Of course, as it has already been mentioned several times, we are coming from different background. Uh, we share uh, different cultural uh, values and uh, different planning methodologies. So the, uh, the countries uh, united within the European Union are not the same and we cannot develop a one size fits all uh, solution. So we are happy to contribute to the uh, process of this uh, project, but uh, of course it is one of the potential solutions if you would like to uh, develop your plans. Uh, in order to understand our uh, methodology, uh, we needed to accept two principles. The first one is coming from one of my best uh, Portuguese friends, Eduardo Medeiros, uh, who uh, summarized the a mission of the cross-border plans and programs, as it uh, can be seen on the screen, uh, it is to reduce the barrier effect of the borders and to valorize the border region's territorial capital. These are the main aims that we should uh, achieve through cross-border strategic planning. And we know that barriers uh, are, uh, can, can be uh, physical, uh, sociopolitical, or mental, cognitive, cultural, linguistic, uh, as you want. Uh, these barriers are always creating uh, distance in geographic space. So barriers are ab ab about distancing. And if you would like to test how have we uh, progressed in the reduction of these barrier effects, we need to check the perceptions and the spatial behavior of the border citizens. Uh, the best test is to map uh, their shopping or smuggling uh, habits. You know, how they are using, how are they using uh, the assets, the territory assets available on the other side of the border. Uh, this is the test bed uh, of barrier, the bordering uh, tendencies uh, which are about the uh, reduction of border barriers. The second principle that we accepted is that uh, we do not target convergence in a cross-border context. Because if you find the same conditions on the other side of the border, you will no longer be uh, curious about this region. Uh, what uh, integration and cohesion is based, it is difference. Uh, why the citizens of Geneva moves to Annemas, or why the citizens of Copenhagen uh, move to uh, Malmö, because there is a different difference maybe in real estate prices, but other conditions are also um, important. So uh, what do we need to reach? It is not convergence between the two regions along the uh, shared border, but it is uh, to ensure the free access to the ter territorial ex uh, assets which are uh, uh, found on the other side of the border, and this is what cohesion is, ab is about. So our uh, methodology is focusing on those factors which can strengthen or hinder stronger cross-border territorial, economic, and social cohesion within a border area. And we, don't, we are not interested in other factors. So it is not a, um, a typical uh, plan uh, or, a, or a strategy which used to be drafted within the confines of the national uh, planning systems. What we are seeking, these are the factors which are important for stronger uh, cross-border cohesion. Uh, 
And uh, we approach this issue from different points of view. I'm going to give you some examples, but we try to accentuate uh, the responses given to the challenges against cross-border cohesion uh, through legal, financial, and governance-based aspects. Because it is not enough to have a strategy, as it has already been highlighted several times, but we need to know how do we implement it, how can we finance it, and how uh, can we overcome the legal obstacles which can hinder the implementation of this uh, strategy. Uh, just some examples, how can we display this uh, methodology on maps? Uh, this is, uh, I'm going to give you uh, examples from the Hungary and Slovak border area. Uh, this is a map of the landscapes shares, shared by the two uh, countries, which clearly uh, indicates that we need uh, cross-border landscape management. These are the water basins crossing the border, which also underlines that there is a need to a more integrated approach towards uh, water management. Uh, this is a map which uh, shows the nature protected areas which are located uh, uh, in adjacent regions uh, very often, which necessitates the cross-border management of natural heritage. This map shows the gravitational zones of the urban centers along the uh, Hungary and Slovak border, including the cross uh, border crossing points as well. And you can see here that these uh, th theoretical influencing zones reach beyond the state border, which means that when we are speaking about functional urban areas in a cross-border context, we need to take into account that there is an urban center which, have, which has uh, uh, enough capacities uh, to be shared across the border. It is a zoom into Bratislava region. Um, this is a map which uh, presents the uh, settlement hierarchy uh, according to the available number of available functions across the border and the uh, accessibility of these urban centers across the border. It's, it's an illustration, and you can see here how the uh, uh, functional uh, center role of Kosice on the Slovak side uh, rules uh, the whole territory, uh, not only on the Slovak, but also on the Hungarian side, which uh, generated a, uh, a, a lively mobility across the border. These are the influencing zones of the ambulance stations on both sides of the border, uh, including their uh, 15 and 30 minutes uh, intervention zones, which are also uh, reaching beyond the border. And these are the uh, influencing zones of the hospitals located within the Hungary and Slovakian uh, programming area. Uh, if we talk about economic cohesion, we need to take into account the geographic pattern of uh, industrial and uh, logistical centers, in, of course, to, uh, a coupled with the transport facilities and the enterprise density, including the largest companies. Here you can see the Audi factory in Jör, which attracts many suppliers, not only on the Hungarian, but also on the Slovak side. This is a map on the cycle path, uh, which should be connected across the border. And uh, regarding social cohesion, we use a lot of uh, data and, and uh, maps here. Just to give you a few examples. It is uh, a map on, on, on the top. You can see a map on unemployment uh, rates uh, along the border, and uh, on the map uh, on the bottom, you can see the uh, settlements populated by Roma uh, minority, including uh, the uh, settle, uh, set of the uh, less, uh, uh, most disadvantaged sub-regions in the two countries, which are adjacent regions. So all these issues are very important when uh, planning the, the, the strategy based on these uh, complementarities. This is a very good example uh, when, where you can see the unemployment rate uh, on the Slovak side, which is much higher than in Hungary, so uh, the solution is on the other side of the border. 
this map shows the aging indices on the two sides of the border. Uh, I don't want to be uh, go. Uh, I don't want to go into details. And this is a map uh, which is about the twinnings between settlements, and municipalities. Uh, uh, you can base uh, your strategy on these existing uh, connections. Um, when uh, defining or, or measuring the perceptions and uh, spatial behavior of the local citizens, we used to use uh, this uh, borderscape as approach. Borderscape means the representations of the border and the border area. And uh, these representations generate uh, spatial behavior or spatial uh, behavior models uh, among the citizens. And uh, we follow a uh, classification uh, designed by Hank van Houtum, a Dutch uh, philosopher of border studies. Uh, we try to measure the uh, indicators in, in, in the respect of cross-border flows, cross-border cooperation, and the border and people perceptions according to this two-dimensional matrix. Uh, we use this uh, methodology in numerous uh, strategic uh, plans and of course it is an iterative process so we have been developing this uh, strategy permanently and finally let me uh, echo those statements which have been uh, given to you at the beginning of this panel uh, when we try to solve an obstacle uh, across the border we will face numerous new one, new uh, obstacles so in order to reach a territorially, economically, and socially uh, cohesive region, we recommend to use this cohesion-based uh, planning methodology that I try to over, uh, summarize to you. But if you want to do this, you will face a problem that you need data, and you have no data on cross-border mobility flows, uh, and, and you, you, don't, uh, you don't have data uh, at low, low two levels, that level which is uh, relevant for your planning. Another, uh, so you need to develop a cross-border monitoring system. Uh, the second, that if you have the strategic plan, you need to develop uh, a structure which will be in charge of uh, the implementation of the strategy. Otherwise, it will not be implemented. Uh, but for this, you need uh, capacity development at local level because uh, it is not self-evident that the uh, people working uh, in the local administration are able to develop cross-border projects. And once you have the strategy and you have the structure as well, you will face the biggest obstacle, and this is the difference between legal and administrative systems. And for this, we miss the solution. Unfortunately, uh, this would be this F FCBS tool. At the moment, 12 member states are heavily opposing this proposal regarding the FCBS. So it is a good mission for us, all of us, to convince uh, the national uh, representatives of our governments to change their mindset and uh, support this FCBS tool in order to eliminate the last obstacle as well. So these are the components that we have to take into account. At SESCI, we are dealing with everything which is included on this, on this figure. Uh, if you are interested, I brought with, my, with me some, exam, some copies of our last activity report, which is found on the table at the exit. Uh, but uh, here on, the, on the website of the SESCI are also found uh, different pieces of information regarding the application of this methodology. Thank you very much for your uh, tolerance. Thank you very much, and also for not only showing us some pretty amazing maps um, and the importance of having the right data, but how to use that and the progression of the complexity of cross-border governance. So thank you. Um, I have questions for all of you, but those are less important than questions from the floor. So I would like to open this. We have a, a question or comment from Ricardo. And in the meantime, I invite others to also think if you have some questions for our panelists. Thank you so much. Um, I'm on the last row, but I'm discreetly here. I like to be discreet. I've always liked it. Uh, 
on the comments made from uh, Rio Minho, uh, I would only want to add one or two clarifications. Um, firstly, on the B-Solutions Initiative. The B-Solutions Initiative publishes all the cases. Each and every case of B-Solutions is a report from an expert. This report is publicly available. You can find any of the cases in the compendia of B-Solutions. If anyone does not know how to find it, here on the table you have a small brochure which has all the links for the B-Solutions. The idea of the B-Solutions is very simple. Several of you know it, several of you have worked with it. Um, we have a region represented by one entity that submits a case, proposes one obstacle, identifies one obstacle that hampers cross-border interaction. And from the Commission side, with the support of AEBR, we provide technical support to do a legal analysis of that case. And together with that legal analysis, we point to a possible pathway for a solution. This is in a report, those reports that are totally published. Uh, but then, implementing the solution depends on the competent authorities. If it is a matter of changing the law, and it's a national law, it's the, na the competent national authorities who can change the law. The region, represented by the beneficiary, has the possibility to make political push for such solution implementation. It's not competence of the European Commission because most frequently the obstacles lay on national or regional law. This is just one clarification. This, uh, we have around 170 different cases. In some of these we have seen implementation of the solutions. In several others not yet. Many are moving in that direction. Several are Several are pointing to a problem which is, de facto, the beneficiaries, the regions, lack the, uh, the capacity to push for the political capital, to push for the implementation of the solution. That was one aspect of clarification that I think is essential to, to, have, to have put on the table. The second one is on the need for strategies and on the need for structures. Uh, and it's clearly interesting to see how the toolbox that we are here discussing today, uh, that, that Stefan was presenting, pointed as one of the first elements being the, 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 the exact term was not institutionalization, but it was this, creating the institutional conditions, creating the structures for allowing for the development of strategies and actions. And one of the comments that Stefan made was, this allows for resilience of the cross-border cooperation processes vis-à-vis -vis the political cycles. And I will not comment on the details of the functioning of the EGTC Rio Minho. Uh, not, not up to me to comment or judge or do any uh, individual assessment. But this case today has shown a clear illustration of this. We need to have uh, strong institutions. We need to have strong cross-border institutions with a cross-border nature for them to be, for them, the institutions in the processes of cooperation to be resilient vis-a-vis -vis changes in the political cycle. Because whenever there is a change in the political cycle, we see normal frictions internal the institutions, and this can lead to a delay in the process of cooperation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ricardo, also for um, definitely pointing out the, the, the point about institutions and the political cycle. Thank you. Um, are there questions, comments? Yes. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I just have a question for Nathan Ball on the um, implementation phase. 
Could you please mention one of the one or several challenges that you faced during the implementation of the strategy? Um, uh, first of all, the construction of the strategy is a is an important challenge because you have to. No, no. During the implementation. Phase. Oh, uh, funding, of course, um, um, and uh, and time because um, in the one of the previous presentation, uh, it was said that uh, financial resources are important, but uh, time is a resource too, and uh, one of the, diff the the major difficulty is time because discussion between two countries or to regions or multiple um, cities, uh, it takes time. And for, for me, uh, I'm, a, I'm a young one in, in the structure, but um, funding, the, funding and time are the most uh, challenging phases of the implementation of uh, a strategic plan. And it's not a problem if you have to take more time uh, than uh, what you want, because a good implement, implemented strategy is better than uh, a bad strategy, uh, bad implemented. So you have to take time and you have to, to have the good funding to do what you want to do and to, to be sure that the orientation that you have can be uh, applied in the future. Yeah, hang on, hang on, we, we're gonna get you a microphone. There, thank you. Um, I just want to, um, to complement um, the answer from Nathan, is that for a cross-border strategy between France and Luxembourg, we have very two different contexts. Uh, France having quite of what we call the onion layer with many, many, many layers, while Luxembourg might have um, shortcuts and more funding in general to implement strategy, so I think we are in a territory with two, two how can I say, balance, balance and, and uh, imbalance in terms of, uh, yes, the level of action and uh, finance. Thanks very much for that addition. Any other questions, comments for our panelists? Yes. It's not an element maybe that has been brought up yet, but I was wondering how much is the active participation and involvement of you, in your case, for example, as the AGTC, in the in this devising and uh, writing of the strategy itself? Because I understand that if, if a strategy comes from outside, uh, and maybe also here Gyula can add uh, the, the point of view of also Chesky, if, if a strategy is made by someone else, is the team really then, does it own it? Do they own it? Do they, are they motivated? While on the other hand, if you're writing it, maybe together with strategists, uh, I guess there's also more willingness uh, to bring it forward. Thank you. Uh, I think yes, in, in our GTC, it's our own strategy. So we, we set it with the, our own objectives. So we, we want to apply the strategy and to complete all of our of our objectives, and because we have cross objectives between all the structures, um, it's it's not so difficult to 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 work on uh, our strategy and the strategy of the other actors, because we all have uh, the same goal, the same objective. For example, about mobility, yes, uh, our EGTC is more about uh, sustainable mobility. The the PMF is more about uh, infrastructures, but the idea is to simplify uh, the mobility between the two borders. So when we have uh, different strategies, but with the same goal, it's, it's very easy. And the idea is every structure have a, have a strategy and every structure has a level of action. So we have to respect uh, that, for example, EGTC uh, is a local uh, level of action, PMF is an upper level of action. And uh, we have to, to cross these strategies with this idea that our EGTC can't uh, rule over and, and, and solve all the problem on the, 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 border, the border line. We have 
our um, 13 uh, towns, and it's already a big challenge. So if another strategy in another level is better than us for a, a bigger um, uh, territory, we don't have a problem to that. And the main idea is uh, we have, at, at the end, we have the same objective, the same idea of what could be good for, for the people. Um, the, the free strategies uh, said that it's, it's, it will be a better cooperation if the, the public uh, mobility is better in train, in bike, in, in shared, uh, shared car. Um, every strategy is good if the idea is we have to, to move better between the two countries. Yes, I think it's a very important point. How can we ensure the ownership? And what, at what level? Uh, the most exciting part of our uh, planning process is the field work. It means that Seski team occupies this territory for a while. We live there and we uh, discuss the plans with everyone who we can reach. It has different uh, layers uh, because we uh, visit all the municipalities. It means, in, in a cross-border context, it, it sometimes means 200 municipalities, you know. We visit all the municipalities, we interview, we make interviews with all the mayors, and uh, we uh, make interviews with uh, entrepreneurs, uh, civil association leaders, uh, educational institutional leaders, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, development experts who are present in the region. And after that, we compile an analysis and we identify the development goals, challenges and responses. The challenges to cross-border cohesion based on the interviews, partly the interviews. And after that, we present this to the local. They have the opportunity to uh, comment these documents, but the decision on the final version is made by the representatives of the municipalities or the EGTC. So this is the uh, process through which we can involve the local citizens. Of course, we are present in the pubs, so we can listen to the discussions, uh, but it, it doesn't mean that these strategies are based on the citizens' own perceptions and, and, uh, and opinion. Thank you very much. I like the, the presence in the pubs also to hear what's going on. It is very important. Um, I know, Hines, you've had experience with uh, external consultants. Do you just have a comment you want to make about working? There's one microphone there. Uh, working with external consultants on the strategy, because that, I think, rounds out the question. It's on. Oh, yeah, thank you. Um, I wasn't there at that time, but I happen to, to know the, the certainly very uh, amazing expertise consultant coming from the academia, with, but with a, uh, amazing experience, uh, mostly in Catalonia and the Pyrenees, and now in Galicia, where he's uh, lecturing and living. And, uh, and yes, he was a driving force behind all this. Uh, I tend to think, I don't know if the perception of uh, Stefan, for instance, was, and the team there was different, but I think that majors, which are the key representatives, or 26 majors, would be, would be very happy to see something happening as long as they didn't have to put 200 euros on the table, okay? So, uh, yep, I don't know if that uh, summarizes. It summarizes. Uh, yeah, that the experience was fine, and, but it, yeah, and we have this, this other issue of ownership, but financing to help make, to solidify the ownership. Um, I had a bunch of questions for the panelists, but that would take us until the next session. Uh, so I would like to thank each one of you for your presentations and your insights and your willingness to, to be here today and, and share with us your experience. We are going to take a 15-minute uh, coffee break. So if we're back at 2, I'm sorry, 3.35, 40, we will then move into our second panel. Thank you very much.
I think the coffee break is just, it may just be just outside, and if it's not, where is it? Just outside, and the uh, lavatories are in that corner over there, if needed.
I can do the presentation first yeah. if you did. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. No. You, you may see the, the red thing. Yeah. Uh, two minutes and there's a button. But also it could be very clear. Yeah. Please. But if the problem is that they're not looking at you yeah. when you're sitting, yeah. that adds to the problem. Yeah. I think you'll be okay. Mm. Let me see. Ah. Let me see that one.
Okay. Thanks. As people are slowly trickling in again, it would be great if we can start with the, the next panel. Uh, could I ask the technical team to put up the, the presentation? And thank you very much. Thank you for all those uh, staying, remaining with us. Um, during today's uh, networking dinner, there's more chance, obviously, to, to get to know each other and exchange on how to set up or reinforce cross-border cooperation mechanisms. OK, so for this panel, um, we're going to focus on cross-border public service delivery, moving from the more theoretical, from more the desk work on strategic planning, to something really tangible that has the potential to create real value, tangible elements for cross-border communities. Again, I would like to, before calling the, the different participants up to stage, I'd just like to use three or four minutes of your time to just set up this, this topic. So delivering cross-border services, essential cross-border services, we're talking about education, transport infrastructure, healthcare infrastructure, it can create enormous value for cross-border regions. However, it can be one of the most challenging and complex activities to implement. Um, so let me just mention a few of the practical, of the, of the benefits, the potential benefits of cross-border service delivery. And the different panelists will provide, in a few minutes, very concrete practical examples, going much more detail on, on the services that can be provided, that are provided in the Cerdanya, but also across, across Europe. So first, it can enhance access to public services in territories that are underserved, uh, territories that are facing, for example, depopulation, cross-border service delivery can ensure that cross-border services are, are service that communities still receive those services, or it can help ensure access to services not only in, in, in certain territories, but also to certain population groups. It can also increase the quality of public services by different authorities on both sides of the border collaborating uh, and pooling their resources and their talent. It can increase the, the affordability of public services, for example, by offering um, uh, waste management services in a, in a larger catchment area, thereby reducing the per capita cost for, for citizens and, and, and reducing the pressure on public budgets. And, and it can support the development of an economic functional area. Think about, for example, the, the construction of new train lines, of bus lines, really connecting uh, economic actors on, on both sides of a, of a border. Uh, these obviously, uh, these infrastructure developments in terms of uh, constructing a new railway is not the first thing when we, what we think about when talking about EGTCs, but it is something really important uh, for this discussion. However, despite these benefits, just to emphasize a couple of the, of the challenges that are, that are being faced and that will be uh, elaborated on further. Uh, first, illegal, regulatory, and administrative barriers. Cross-border service delivery may not be permitted according to national legislation or the baby limitations, or cross-border service standards may differ in different countries, uh, which are challenges that would have to be overcome, that would have to be addressed. We're also talking, for example, about uh, resource capacity differences, the capacity of, of users of public services to pay for uh, uh, certain services may be different in, uh, on opposite sides of the border, but also of the involved authorities to contribute to, to the management and the organization uh, of service delivery. And also talk about, for, think about, for example, cultural differences in, in healthcare provision. Are the expectations of French citizens and of Spanish citizens towards the healthcare that they are receiving, are those similar? How to deal with that? How to manage the expectations of users? Now let's return to, to, the, to the framework. Um, Cross-border public service delivery it depends on several conditions being in place. As you may remember from the presentation earlier, we have a specific development area that looks at cross-border service delivery, but there are other elements that also contribute to this. For example, in the discussion about defining the need and a shared understanding of what cross-border collaboration, enhanced collaboration uh, can achieve, a discussion on increasing, creating new or, or enhancing the, the, the service delivery of, of, of public service, is an essential element to take into account. But also, it re is really relevant for monitoring and evaluation. Monitoring and evaluation practices uh, can help identify whether the cross-border services that are, that are delivered, are they meeting citizen 
citizen needs. Are we really increasing uh, the access to and the, set, uh, the user satisfaction of, of certain services? Uh, obviously, the, the funding and financing element really closes touches upon cross-border public services. Um, because obviously cross-border regions, cross-border collaborating partners need sufficient funding and financing to ensure not only that uh, the physical infrastructure is there to, to provide uh, public services, but also that the, the authorities managing the service delivery, such as EGTCs, have the necessary resources to actually do this. And finally, as mentioned earlier, the element of political support is crucial, not only to kickstarting to, to initiating the idea of, of cross-border service delivery, but also making sure that there's political will is mobilized to address service delivery challenges along the way. If regulatory obstacles are identified, to be able to knock on the right doors to see if changes are possible to overcome these challenges. So it's about getting, generating sufficient political support and maintaining it over time. These are just four elements, specific uh, considerations that are included in the tool that relate to public service delivery. There are a series of recommendations or considerations on, on the need to identify shared and diverging service needs in a cross-border area uh, and how cooperation can, can, uh, can address these. And also considerations in terms of is, is addressing or, or can, for example, through enhanced cross-border cooperation, can these service needs be met or do they need to be met through, through more traditional uh, mechanisms? Second, what, what necessity is there to re review and revise and adopt and adjust uh, regulation and, uh, and legislation? And who, on whose door do we need to knock to make this happen? Furthermore, it is the definition of the specific tasks, what specific services are being met, are, 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 should be delivered, where in which part of the, the cross-border area, which beneficiaries, is it for the public in general, is it for, um, for, for students, is it for the economic actors, etc. And to obviously develop a very clear organizational and delivery model indicating how financial resources uh, will be mobilized and will be spent, what infrastructure will be used and how, um, but also who is the main service provider. Uh, and what role, for example, can EGTCs or other cross-border cooperation initiatives or bodies have to manage public service delivery? Um, so all of these are topics that we hope to explore in the next session. Uh, we have about uh, 45 minutes for doing so. And to help us in that discussion and to share a, a great wealth of knowledge, I would like to ask to stage uh, Sabine Zilmer uh, from Spatial Foresight and Xavier Conil, uh, uh, Director General of the EGTC Cerdanya Hospital. Thank you very much for being with us, and we look very much forward to two very different perspectives uh, or vantage points on cross-border service. And could I ask Sabine to start with the presentation? Thank you, Stefan, for the kind introduction and also to you and your whole team for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to share a few insights we have collected over the years um, from different studies. Um, I will start with a, a pretty much European overview and I'm trying, ah, now it works. And um, I will try to focus 15 minutes on, first, give you a rough overview where my funny ideas I want to present come from, um, and share with you how we defined cross-border public services, because not everybody may have exactly the same understanding, just to ensure we are on the same grounds. And please forgive me that, as of now, I will not say cross-border public services, but simply use the shortcut CPS, otherwise I take too many time just saying cross-border public services. So um, then I'll share with you a bit of empirical evidence, what we have identified uh, through different studies. And you have already heard several times the number 
around 1,550 CPS uh, this, uh, during this afternoon. So I will dwell a little bit on that. And then I have a few slides also on the relation between the CPS and EGTCs, because we have the, pilot, the five pilot regions here with us um, who all have at least one EGTC somewhere involved, if not as the main body. So I think it's worthwhile to dwell into that a little bit. So where does do all the insights come from? We did, um, in principle, three um, studies on CPS for ESPON and for DG Regio, so for the Commission. Uh, since between 2017, we started until 2022. Um, it's not only special foresight, <laughs> so this is now my advertisement se session, um, but we did that with different consorts here. Um, to collect and, and have enough capacity and resources to obtain the different insights you need for that. And I also um, complement this, these insights with several findings from EGTC studies. We did also for DG Regio, for the European Committee of the Regions and for a German agency for even a longer time, basically the last 10, 12, 12 years, just as a short background. So what are CPRs? Um, we differentiate them across nine policy areas in the analysis. Today, I will only focus on a few of them, so mainly healthcare, emergency services, we have transport services, we have job placement or other citizen support services. So just as an idea to uh, out of all the nine areas. So when do we, did we take things on into this data list or inventory of 1,500 something CPRs? A service that materialize in a special or specified cross-border area. That can be very narrow. It can be also very large, but it's not just two points cooperating somewhere, two capitals with each other, right? Um, these services address either a shared problem or a joint development opportunity. And I think I don't need to go into details because you already mentioned a couple of those problems or opportunities. Um, it should target groups on both sides of the border or have a target group on both sides of the border that do not need to be the same um, on each side. So we could have the employers on the one side coming back to the different unemployment rates we heard earlier from Julia. Um, and on the other side, it's the employees, just as an example. But, and they can of, be of different sizes and so on. The service should be non-discriminatory, so we do not limit the access by certain criteria from the start. And what is particularly important, it's publicly organized in some context. So that means it can be a public authority, it can be delivered through a concession or another contractual agreement, also through private service providers, but we have a public stake in there. And to really ensure the public stake, we say it should also have at least some public financing component in there. Um, we discussed these categories of criteria with uh, several experts for quite a while to find them. And we do not want to consider services that are just introduced or offered for the other side of the border for people when they are organized only from the one side, but we would like to say the involvement to different extents doesn't matter, but at least the cooperation across the border. And to differentiate it from the building of bridges, new railway lines, and so on, we say it's about potentially the use of infrastructure, not the development, the building of infrastructure, and to differentiate it from interreg projects. It's in principle thought to be 
without a limited time frame. So what did we find um, back the at the latest stage in 2022? Roughly 200. I don't re need to repeat the number. Um, but out of this number, uh, about 900 services are related to transport. That has a certain history why that is like that. Um, we find the highest densities, surprisingly, around the Benelux countries, around the German-French border, um, also in the far north between Finland and Sweden, and along a few local spots. So, for instance, some twin cities have developed quite a number of um, CPRs. And these are typically areas that have um, CPRs at, um, with across several policy areas, so very diverse set of CPS. Um, we see over the past, let's say, 10, 15 years, more newly developing CPS in other parts of Europe, especially in Southern Europe and in Central and Eastern Europe. And at internal borders, there are relatively few segments that have, do not have any CPS, but that's mainly due to the fact that we have a lot of transport services. But however, um, not everywhere the potentials for CPRs are equally well used. And we must admit, this is the state of 2022. Definitely things have changed since then. We have definitely some suspended CPRs. Um, and there are certainly new cases which are not yet in the database. So we have the five pilot regions, and I just zoomed into um, our maps a little, be, little bit, and I hope you're not too surprised whether you find a lot of CPRs or hardly any in your region. Um, so what do we see? Um, we see the full variety we can see across Europe. We have among the pilot regions, those that have really a lot of CPRs in their region and others with hardly anything, which is due, of course, to a lot of reasons, very different histories, different governance structures, different institutional frameworks, and so on and so on. And these services, um, even if they are provided in the region, they are not necessarily provided by the EGTCs or the, or the representatives of your pilot regions. They may be provided by different actors in their regions. Let's come to some selected policy areas. So I focus a little bit on healthcare, transport, and employment, hoping that they, these are uh, areas that are of most interest to you. Um, Within each of the policy areas, we further looked into more detail what types of services do we have there. And we have different objectives of service, different tasks. So for instance, for transport, it's not, the majority is, but it's not just about the actual transport mean across the border, so which I step on and travel across, but this is also about maintenance of infrastructure or joint ticketing, so other services all around transport. Or in the case of healthcare, it's a lot, it can be about primary healthcare, whether between doctors, so a doctor access or hospital access and so on. Um, but we can also see cases of long-term care or emergency care or medical services where, for instance, facilities are shared between hospitals across the border. Um, you can see from the maps, probably not too difficult, it's not too difficult that transport we see most widely, most equally distributed, and this is mostly the transport means, so where I really jump on and go across. For healthcare, most um, services we identified were on emergency and much less on primary um, care. 
And even within the primary care, we see a lot of different forms. So for instance, for the hospital in Sardinia, I don't want to say more about that, but we also see the SOAST in these healthcare zones between uh, Belgium and France, or access to a hospital across the border, and so on. And from these three fields, at least, um, employment services, found, we found the le le less or less evidence than for the others. Looking into the role of EGTCs, um, I, I screened our database a little bit and um, found not that many EGTCs all immediately that provide CPR. So I put up a couple of pictures here um, of examples where an EGTC provides services. Again, Hospital of Sardinia is self-speaking. Probably everybody in the room knows that case. But we have also a transport card, a family pass at the uh, Austrian-Italian border. We have um, some educational and natural um, resor uh, services Nature Park Resources at um, the Geopark Karavanken at the Austrian-Slovenian border, a citizenship card um, that allows easier access across the border for citizens at the Portuguese-Spanish border, or a mobility platform, which is more a, um, in a digital placed case. There are certainly more cases in the database, um, which are more difficult to identify, and there are certainly more cases around, but still, the question arises, even if there are twice or three times as many, it's not a lot among 1,500 something. So why is that? And for that to um, identify, I went back to ask myself, what is the main purpose of an EGTC, and what is the main purpose of a CPS. Um, and I went back to the EGTC regulation, the amended version from 2013, and the primary objective is the implementation of territorial cooperation actions. This is the primary objective of an EGTC, to strengthen cohesion. And this is much wider than looking at services, much wider. So, and if we go back, in the very first regulation from 2006, service provision was not even actually thought of. That came sort of in, and also the permission to explicitly allow um, fund raising through fees was previously not even mentioned. In addition, we have some limitations in the membership structure that can affect the possibility to actually provide CPS. And I don't want to go into the details of the objectives of CPS because Stefan already mentioned quite a number of benefits of the CPS, but it, this is much more about the flows, the connections, and functional areas, whether economic functional areas or also in other contexts, and contributing to efficiency uh, or overcoming gaps of service provision in the regions. Because my time is running out, I believe, um, I will at least trigger a few thoughts. When we look into how can we provide or deliver CPS, we have three different, principally, three principally different structures. A network model, we have the central provision from one side of the border, and these two models actually predominate the overall CPS provision as far as we could identify. The third model, where we have a joint structure with bodies from both sides of the border, account for the minority of um, CPS provision. And apart from the EGTC, there are also other um, structures that can follow that centrally based uh, structure under uh, um, international law. 
Stefan already mentioned a lot of aspects that need to be considered when I do or try to develop a CPS. We back then in, in 2018 developed it like a windmill because we said it's not a one-time and linear process, but there are a lot of things that interact with each other. And depending on where I set which variable, I may have to adjust other ones. In any case, there are a couple of benefits for choosing an EGTC. One of them is visibility. I don't want to go through the whole list, but I just give you one example. Nearly everybody in the EGTC sphere who knows EGTCs knows about OICOR, this Upper Rhine University Corporation Center, which is organized or has been set up as an EGTC. The Greater Region University, at least as far as I noticed, is much less well known. I mean, of course, in France, definitely. <laughs> um, I'm just looking at you, but um, not everywhere. So, but nevertheless, we see a lot of other roles also for EGTCs when it comes to CPS, not just in the direct provision, but in the field of brokerage and also with helping setting them up. So here's a full list of different types of activities, some softer, some already moving towards the provision at least, um, or, or initiating it, but um, I think that takes too long. If you want to know more, um, the web application that had, has been developed under the last uh, project is still available on that link. Um, but is supposed to move sooner or later through to a joint new uh, platform, which is under development by the GRC right now, to my knowledge. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sabina, for this, this really illustrative uh, and clear presentation and for focusing specifically or making the transition or a really nice bridge to the presentation by Xavier um, to look at the value added of EGTCs for public service delivery. Ladies and gentlemen, Xavier from the EGTC Cerdaña. Uh, that's it for faire fonctionner. D'accord. Bon dia a tots. Bonjour à tout le monde. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Xavier uh, Cornilla. We speak French because my English is even worse than my French, so you're better off with me speaking French. I uh, represent uh, the EGTC uh, Sardinia Hospital together with my colleagues at the table, Mr. Liber, uh, Dr. Torres, who's left the room, who is the uh, head of the emergency room, and Mr. Otto who uh, represents the uh, CTP, the uh, Pyrenees Working Community. Two observations to begin with. I would like to thank the organization for inviting us to take the floor today. And I would also like to underline that we uh, could uh, participate in this work thanks to the Pyrenees working uh, community who um, made this uh, trans uh, cross-border uh, working experience possible. Let me uh, tell you a few things about CTP. Please tell me when uh, I have five minutes left. And then one other um, observations before I begin my speech. I am feeling better uh, now uh, than I used to be in the past. We are through, we are through uh, cross-border public services. The Pyrenees Working Community is a cross-border entity which uh, uh, comprises French uh, and uh, uh, Spanish um, authorities uh, together with Andorra. Along the border, 
uh, from the Atlantic Ocean to the Mediterranean uh, Sea. Uh, it is uh, currently chaired by Karoli Delga, who is the president of the Occitanie region. But it is a rotating presidency. Uh, for uh, 40 years, uh, we sought to promote exchanges between territories and agents in the region to find common solutions to common problems. I mean the common problems uh, to uh, border regions, but they are specific uh, for each area. And I think this is something I have to highlight. We are faced with uh, common uh, problems in border regions, but these problems are not the same as the ones which states uh, have to face. We um, operate with two uh, instruments, the uh, Pyrenean uh, strategy and the Interreg Poctefa program, of which uh, uh, the CTP is the management body. Um, we uh, worked with a B uh, solution uh, project, and this helped us develop or set up the Sardania Hospital. The Sardinia Hospital is the first and only cross-border hospital in Europe. And by that, I mean that it is one of a kind. It is co-managed. And uh, offers unique services to all citizens. Why did we uh, set up uh, an EGTC? Because uh, it is the only instrument we could identify between uh, 2005 and 2007 uh, to bring together around the same table um, the uh, Generalitat de, of Catalonia and the French uh, minister. It, is the, it was the only tool at our disposal to promote hospital exchanges and to promote health services. The uh, Spanish state uh, uh, cannot uh, plan such uh, activities, uh, at least not in the health sector. We uh, were, uh, our uh, cross-border uh, project uh, was recognized in 2005. What is Sardinia? It's a very small area on the uh, French-Spanish uh, border uh, shared between uh, France and, the, and Catalonia. There are two parts, Lower Sardinia in the south, so in Spain, and High Sardinia in uh, France. And Cap Cirque is in the north. It is an isolated area. Cap Cirque is, is in the north, huh? which means that uh, to uh, travel uh, from uh, the hospital to uh, Toulouse, we need two and a half hours, uh, to Perpignan, two, and a, two hours, uh, to Barcelona, two hours. So you'd need at least two hours to travel to main urban centers. So what did we do? We uh, built this uh, hospital with the uh, EDRF uh, funds, which amounted to 60%. The rest came from the uh, Generalitat de Catalonia and from France to the proportion of 40%. The operations are funded uh, by Catalonia for 60% and by France for 40%. We have uh, 349 workers in the hospital. We have a management board uh, comprising 14 uh, members, 60% uh, from Catalonia and 40% uh, from uh, uh, France through the regional health uh, agency in Occitanie. We also have an advisory board with uh, elected representatives from the two uh, regions, 
we also have an executive uh, board um, because we have the uh, director general of the health, regional health um, agency and uh, um, people from, uh, from Catalonia as well. And uh, Mr. Biber and myself uh, are in the uh, general uh, management uh, so as to reflect uh, both uh, regions. And we also have a management committee just like in any other hospital. We are a small hospital. We are isolated, but we work at a small scale. And we offer technical facilities to the uh, 30,000 or so uh, um, people who live in the area. And for some 180,000 people who come as tourists, either in the summer or in the winter. So we have technical facilities and an emergency room. So as uh, to meet the needs of these people. But we don't work on our own. We are part and parcel of a network. These are our French partners. You see the hospital in uh, Perpignan, the hospital in Foix, the uh, pediatric hub in uh, Cerdagne. We also have health uh, centers. And in blue, uh, you see our partners in the south, uh, in Aves, in uh, Barcelona, and other partners with which we have a health network on a specific area, on a specific territory. It is a true uh, European cross-border health area. But, well, not everything is so rosy. We face a number of challenges. First of all, we have to run the hospital. We're only managers. And we specialize in cross-border activities. We um, spent a lot of time on cross-border activities, but in the end, we only hospital managers. How can we provide health services to uh, citizens who have the same needs, but with two uh, different legal systems and uh, very similar priorities? So legal systems differ um, in terms of labor, tax issues, um, social contributions, uh, regulation is not the same on both sides of the border. So sometimes we have to uh, pay different salaries for the same work. And we are far away from uh, decision-making centers. Barcelona, Montpellier, and Madrid and Paris are very far away. Brussels is even further away, but not only in geographical terms, also in terms of mentalities. There are only 30,000 inhabitants in this uh, region, and we only get 30 million euros to run this hospital in this very complex setting. There are two uh, states, two uh, regional administrations, and we uh, work hand in hand with some 40 municipalities. And just like any other uh, small scale hospital, we have a hard time recruiting doctors who uh, receive the same pay as uh, in other um, hospital uh, centers, but they have to understand two different systems. They need to speak three languages. Uh, they have to uh, cooperate with all these partners. This is not easy. And 
we also have to um, uh, you, we, we also have to respect the use solely. Um, and this is a source of misunderstandings and of problems. What are the solutions? More local and regional governance. We will need uh, to reformulate uh, certain governance bodies. We'll have to work on continuous uh, training, not in medicine or not in nursing either. We'll have to work on continuous training in cooperation and cross-border collaboration. We'll have to improve generosity and align our macro objectives. We'll have to work on common health planning. We'll also have to take into account our exceptional status. We need to work towards recognition of a European health area for border areas. We can not apply the same rules as in Madrid, Barcelona, Montpellier, uh, Paris, or Berlin. We need to obtain this uh, specific status. We need more Europe. Maybe this is not the right time to uh, speak about that, but we need more Europe. We need to uh, recognize the importance of border areas in a, Euro in, in a citizen-centered Europe. We uh, must debate on disagreements between states and regions. And we need to, need to address uh, specific regulatory uh, systems in border regions when it comes to uh, certifications, mobility, transport, uh, tax issues. Why can't we move uh, towards a, uh, a cross-border workers statute for workers in EGTC? We've learned a lot in the last 20 years. We had a need and we provided an answer or a solution. If there is a need, there can be a solution. But regional uh, support is not enough. We felt we were on our own, that we did not get any support. L local priorities were not always acknowledged in the capitals. We cannot always wait for everything to be resolved before we start operating. We started with, a, with many uh, problems, and many of these problems are still there. But the uh, hospital operates quite well. We need clear objectives and shared goals. We need to be flexible and generous. We are some 30,000 inhabitants, and we have the right to make mistakes. This is not a huge problem, but when you make mistakes with 30 million euros, uh, it is about the, it amounts to the cost of a large hospital like the one in Barcelona for a fortnight. So we've um, we've made a pro we've made progress. If we believe in this uh, project, we will improve. There will be good times and not so good times, but it's only uh, if we uh, continue to improve that we will reach our goals. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for, uh, for this presentation. It's always a pleasure to to hear the clarity of your presentation, and I, uh, with that, with these presentations, I, I wonder why uh, you are still alone, why you are still feeling so. <laughs> um, before turning to some questions that we that we prepared, I would like to ask to open the floor already to ask if there 
questions or comments? I see already two hands. If we can get there's Mr. Codelo in the back, and then Peter at your front. Uh, and if you could say your name and then. Well, it's not. Oh yes, now it's on. Uh, Daniel Codelo de Luxembourg, Monsieur Conil. Je... Mr. Conil, I listened to you very carefully. You said that you were not paying the same amount of money to uh, professionals, but you also mentioned uh, use uh, solely. Uh, which labor code do you have to apply? Because in uh, our area, on the uh, French Luxembourg uh, border, uh, border um, uh, we are faced with a law which is still blocked at the Council of Ministers since the, the 80s. And you uh, seem to uh, have no uh, problems. Uh, we want to set up this health uh, center in this region, which is desperately lacking one. How are you operating? If you have concluded after my presentation that I had no problem at all, then I missed my point. So what do we do? Most uh, workers um, have a contract under Catalonian uh, law. But we also enjoy the help of the uh, Perpignan Hospital, which um, has uh, seconded a number of professionals to our hospital. So they have the status of uh, professionals at uh, Perpignan. So they are considered as uh, French uh, doctors. They will pay social contributions in France, and they pay taxes in France, and, and they uh, will uh, have uh, retirement rights in France, pension rights in France. But we uh, want to fight uh, for a European status for EGTC workers, but we uh, cannot do this on our own. There is another question. It's here from Valérie. Oui, bonjour. Je suis Valeria Cenaki de la Commission européenne. My name is Valeria Cenaki from the European Commission. I had the honor uh, to go to your hospital to see what it was like and to show that you were not on your own. I wanted to thank you, uh, Xavier, because on the, uh, one of your slides, uh, I read some sort of manifesto of, for uh, cross-border cooperation. There is something I realized when I was listening uh, to you when it comes to cross-border public services. Sometimes the citizen does not understand why they need cross-border public services. We discussed with uh, people in the hospital, and uh, I think that uh, for all uh, cross-border public services, or all public services in general, um, not everybody realizes how important these services are. My question is the following. How can you, how, uh, can you, how do you uh, convince uh, citizens of the need to provide such services? Je peux être très sincère. C'est aussi une question un peu pour Sabine qui a peut-être une vision. And this is also a question addressed to uh, Sabine, who has probably a different point of view on this. Trop poli, politique. I won't be very politically correct. Citizens need this hospital and needed this hospital. Otherwise, they had to uh, travel for hours. So they need this hospital, and they are very happy about it. This is for citizens. But then there are also politicians. 
some elected uh, represent representatives uh, uh, are still regret nowadays that the hospital is on the border. And we hear this day in, day out. But, well, this is something we have to accept. Uh, elected representatives tend to say this so as to obtain something else in other sectors, so not in the health sector. So what can we do? We have to coordinate, we have to cooperate, and we have to help, we have to help ourselves for the sake of doctors and nurses in our hospital. And this is what we are working on currently. Um, yeah, thank you, Valerie. Valeria. Um, how do you convince people that a CPS would be good? I had s some cases where it was the opposite, that the local people were very much in favor, and then all of a sudden, from a higher level, everything was stopped. And of course, not always the benefit is felt as long as there is nothing. But once there is the opportunity, not everybody will feel the benefit, but some people, or I remember also, at least one case, but there were definitely more, um, where first extreme cases had to happen, that people uh, died because there was no emergency service across the border, and an agreement could only be reached after such incidents. Um, so, and then everything was all of a sudden easy, that doesn't mean that everybody is always happy with the service. Um, but at least locally, I think it's, the at least to what we see, um, the challenging factors are more, more often at higher levels to convince the need for, to change laws, to, to find agreements, to overcome... Um, the, the different settings and so on. And in several cases, it's also a matter of, I mean, we, we heard it several times with the resources and cross-border issues, cross-border cooperation is still a voluntary action for many, many local authorities. And if resources are scarce, they tend to stop that and, and uh, do not do that what would be for the benefit of um, their citizens. I don't know whether that answers your question in full. Are there, yeah, I see there in the corner a question. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. <clears throat> thank you for the floor. My name is Maciej Molak. I'm a former head of JS Interreg uh, Czechia Poland, and now I uh, develop my research about C CPC and only f few points about the governance and economic aspects. Uh, I think the institution aspect can be a kind of trap in uh, CPC because it's a, again robust structure uh, which is not uh, really often uh, multi-level governance because it's established by public uh, institution Again, is, uh, there is uh, dependency on the public uh, authorities in both countries, and maybe it's a uh, better way is to establish CPC as uh, international agreements, which are maybe less robust, but more flexible uh, tool. Uh, I made my PhD thesis about the risk management and fire protection in our borderlands and show us that the good international agreement is a really useful and effectiveness uh, tool for implement CPC. Uh, and the second one, which is maybe less popular argument, but uh, the CPC is a great 
tool for economy of scale for the peripheral uh, territory and develop the, the motivation could be economic and financial only for the uh, develop uh, the CPC and it's a good point for the stakeholders uh, we can create some multi-levels cross-border uh, governance which are more dynamic than hierarchical management in the national level uh, but still the huge problem is a national system of financing of, cross, uh, of uh, public services when the money follow the users in education, healthcare system, and that means if there, there is no motivation for pay the money over the uh, border to the second side. And I think for it is a great idea of European cross-border mechanism which can be the solution for these national problems which uh, demotivated, uh, demotivated uh, the, for the CPC. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to ask if Sabine would like to comment on that in terms of the, the governance structures. And, and can I add a question to that? Um, you, at, in the last slides, you focused on, on the role of the EGTCs and you said that it was a body that is not very often selected or used for cross-border public service. Could you, from, from the research that you've done, are there specific circumstances or specific services for which EGTCs are an important body or can be a very useful body? I'm not saying necessarily to deliver the service as in the case of the EGTC, as the Sardinia Hospital, but support for them coordinated. Um, first of all, Agreements are wonderful, yes, um, but they are not always the solution. Sorry to say that. They can be a very important um, step, but without putting the agreement into action, we have a lo lovely agreement and nothing changes. So um, this is not self-fulfilling. We have seen exactly such cases where an agreement did not alone solve the problem. It can be the, the solution, but um, often it needs more. Um, you also said that there's sometimes no will to pay across the border. Um, I would put it even worse. Sometimes authorities are not even allowed. I know cases where um, local authorities uh, told me we would like to pay for this cross-border public transport service because our region benefits from that service. But we are not allowed because it is provided from the, by the other side. Um, and this is something I think we need to work on, that this cannot happen. Um, you asked for when is an EJTC uh, very useful to um, provide or support CPS. I think in general, for support of development, I think any cross-border, uh, cross-border, not transnational, but cross-border EJTC also which is more or less a Euro region, Euro district, or represents the typical cross-border cooperation structure, um, is very useful to help developing CPRs to, in, as, uh, as a broker, to bring together people uh, to, um, in, because they know the region best, they know the needs or at least they should <laughs> but I think you presented that that you know what the needs are in your region so um, and they know the other actors that you may need for the CPRs and you can possibly do pilots we see examples where pilot pr service provision has been initiated by an, EG by an EGTC and then somebody else took over later to prove that there was demand, just as one idea. There are many roles in this overall context. Um, when is an EGT suitable to deliver the service itself? 
mm, I, I, it's, I could not pinpoint it to service to certain policy areas or services. I think it's very much um, a matter of um, what you really need. Is the service provision possible also? Does it really need one entity? Is this one entity necessary to do that? Um, is the provision really necessary or should it be done under um, public responsibility, so not under concession or whatever? Um, and then we come back to this uh, case I just mentioned where there is either no will or no possibility to transfer the funds across the border, but you can transfer them to a joint entity. Then you have some of the circumstances, but these, I think the, the whole system is too complex to pinpoint it to very clear services or clear institutional settings. It's, it's, um, it has many, many dependent variables. Pardon, moi je voudrais répondre. I apologize. I'd like to reply to that same question. I agree, this is expensive, and not everyone has the possibility to pay for this. But since we are only technicians, so to speak, we have, there are three things we have to keep in mind. The cost of not doing it. What's the cost of not doing it? In our case, for instance, the cost of transfer of all the inhabitants of Sardinia, uh, of, you know, bringing them by taxi, by ambulance to another hospital, the cost would be extremely expensive. The second cost we need to keep in mind is the cost of duplication. If somebody says 30 million euros for a small hospital, that's a lot of money. But if we had two, it would might not be exactly the double, but it would be 50 million. Number three, it is the economic benefit uh, for the territory. If we didn't have the Sardinia Hospital, the main source of um, economic attraction brought by the hospital uh, is enormous. So the economic success of the area depends on the hospital also, not solely, but also. Give it very warm round, uh, round of applause for the excellent presentations and interventions and for your questions. And with that, we are transitioning to the, to the last discussion of today, which focuses on the crucial issue of funding and financing for cross-border bodies and actions, um, which will be uh, the initial presentation by my colleague Verinia, uh, and then a, another a moderated discussion. Great. Um, thank you very much, Stefan. Um, we will move to our last, our last discussion, uh, which centers on the third dimension of the framework and the tool that we were presenting. And it has to do with uh, the all-important question of money and one of the biggest resource issues. So funding and financing for cross-border bodies. 
Um, I'm going to start as I started before with a very brief introduction to the topic and some of the elements of the tool and then we will move into our panel discussion with um, two of our pilot regions and one region that is not a pilot region. So effective cross-border cooperation and terms of the funding and financing, it really depends on having enough. Um, and enough that is sustainable, not enough just to get off the ground, but enough to keep on going. Now, when we think about funding and financing, in a sense, we need to think about it in two dimensions, in two respects. The first is operational, and it's operational being internal to the cross-border body. Does it have enough funding and financing, again, not only to start its operations, but to maintain its operations over time and to be able to grow if need be? Is there sort of, is that funding and financing able to expand? Is there a certain uh, flexibility to it? And the second aspect of the funding and financing is what I would call external in terms of the ability to use funding and financing to help implement initiatives or to support initiatives that meet the objectives of the cross-border region and the objectives of the cross-border body, why it is there. And for this, there's some pretty critical elements to consider. Um, the first is resource disparities between the partners. In some cases, you have territories on one side of a border that have more financial resources. They are just wealthier regions. That will affect the, the financing, or could affect the financing of the cross-border entity. It could also affect the financing of implementing initiatives in a, in a variety of ways, depending on how these initiatives are funded. Um, the political commitment to to initiate uh, the, the cross-border entity, certainly, but the political commitment to continue funding it over time is another consideration. And to invest in projects and invest in the like, raison d'etre of the, um, the cross-border entity and uh, activity. Another point to consider is partnership with non-government actors, and that can be, um, in terms of support in kind by citizens. We see that quite a bit in uh, Lille Euro Metropole, and we'll be hearing about that. Uh, or um, support through public-private partnerships in implementing certain services. Another point that is very important, we'll go into this later, is the need to diversify resources or diversify the sources of, resor of, of resources. Um, Multi-year financial planning and also uh, project planning is, is a critical consideration because that gives you a perspective in time as to where, how much funding you're going to need and where that may come from. And finally, flexibility in your resources and the, or in the resources of the EGTC or the other cross-border cooperative body, and we'll, we'll talk about that as well. So these are some of the common challenges, and that, that's what fed those, those points to consider. One is what we were seeing in some of the, in many of the bodies that we were looking at, is um, they, tick, they typically rely on member contributions for their operations and on interreg funds for projects. And this becomes a very narrow source of funding and financing. Uh, there is much more out there, and I think one of the areas for uh, consideration is how to expand that. How can cross-border organizations uh, seize the opportunities offered by different funding sources. Um, there's also limited multi-year investment planning. Most uh, investment takes place on a project-by-project -project basis rather than uh, combining that with a longer-term horizon in terms of thinking about where the investment is going to need to go in the future based on the objectives for the region and the needs of the citizens. Limited revenue flexibility, and by this we mean that um, 
in some cases, there isn't much margin to increase, for example, membership fees or revenues over time as circumstances change. Um, and that becomes more difficult for the body because the, the income may remain stagnant while costs go up. Limited staff capacity. This is sort of a resource in general, but also limited capacity in terms of uh, staff who have the skills or the expertise to mobilize funding and to manage, um, manage funds, particularly from EU programs. And finally, sort of lower private sector engagement. So, for example, this is more the case in service delivery. So in service delivery, often as, as uh, Sabine was, was pointing out, it has a lot to do for roads or um, other kind of concrete, tangible infrastructure. And these are areas where it's more feasible to have um, public-private partnerships or concessions, um, railroads, toll roads, et cetera. But there isn't too much of that. So that's another um, funding and financing challenge that we were seeing. So what are some of the considerations in the analytical tool that we, we are bringing forward to focus on? First, it, I think it's really to state the obvious that funding and financing is a, are cornerstones in cross-border governance. Without it, you can't do very much. So first, when we think about uh, the institutional dimension, the funding and the financing really supports decision making regarding um, what kind of body to establish and what that body is going to be responsible for. Because the funding and the financing, at least at the beginning, is what's going to make that most realistic. Then it's also very important in order to design realistic cross-border initiatives. You know, what money you have in order to be able to spend it, also where it's coming from and how long it's going to last. Um, it should inform the design of monitoring and evaluation activities because one of the things that we tend to forget is that monitoring and evaluation can be costly. It requires a, re a certain amount of resources. And finally, funding and, fun funding and financing can drive lobbying and advocacy decisions and activities, not just um, because one might want more funding and financing, but because there may be ways to better use funds that need the lobbying and the advocacy, for example, for service delivery, or for example, for making uh, cross-border uh, work, uh, what we were speaking about with Sardinia and the, and the transfer of labor forces, that much more flexible, and there is a funding and financing dimension to that. Um, in order, so, some of the considerations when thinking about funding and financing over for uh, cross-border work is to really identify and quantify uh, the funding and the financing needs of the body and of the region for staffing, for the operations, and for public investment. Develop multi-year budgets to the extent possible, even if it's just for the organization, and um, maintain project pipelines because that gives you visibility into the future. Identify and mobilizing fun, funds and financing, for example, through membership contributions, grants, loads, diversify the, um, the base, the, the financial resource base. And also ensure the, the adaptability of membership contributions. And that may, be, that, that may have to come up front uh, in when a body is being established, but it could also come later. Um, but creating space for that becomes pretty, pretty critical, especially as needs change and as the ambitions of a cross-border body may uh, expand, may also change and shift. And finally, make sure there's capacity in-house to manage this. Make sure there's capacity to mobilize and manage funds um, and, and financing uh, responsibilities. So, With that, I'd like to invite our panelists to join uh, me up here. And we have to, uh, we will be hearing from Mr. Uh, Loïc Deluvne. 
Loïc, uh, who is the general director of the EGTC of Eurometropole, Lille, Korczyk, and Tournai. From, and I apologize in advance, Ingrida Leskevins, see, maybe, uh, who is the chief investment specialist from the EGTC Nimen uh, Numinas in Lithuania, Poland, and from Ms. Romina Kosina, or Ko Ko Kocina, uh, the director of the EGTC in Gorizia, Nova Gorica, uh, Italy, and Slovenia. So we'll be hearing from each of our panelists about their experiences with respect to funding and financing in their uh, cross-border regions and for their bodies. So I'd like, what I'd like to do is um, to start with Loïc. And yeah. Uh, the, oh, I think. Uh, <laughs> bonjour. Uh, Good afternoon, I will be speaking in French. So this is a big, a big issue, this issue of uh, funding, financing and funding, and it's uh, sinners of war, as we say. Um, let me get back to some historical facts uh, behind uh, the creation of the first EGTC, uh, which is the Eurometropole uh, uh, Tournée. It's been in existence for 15 years now, but let's not forget all the financial contributions that were put in place to create this uh, cross-border cooperation at the time. And that's why this uh, timeline allows us to see where we come from, what was the human and financial involvement. I see many uh, known faces around here of people who have uh, contributed to the creation of this EGCT um, at a macro-regional level. So the Euro Metropole is uh, located on the Franco-Belgian border, 620 kilometers long. So Euro Metropole is an administrative structure which is really uh, located on uh, three areas, Wallonia, Flanders, and the north of France. So that is our territory. We don't have an issue of uh, crossing borders. We don't have geographical uh, obstacles. We have uh, an urban continuum so we can cross the border without any obstacle. So uh, this is a big topic for us because the creation of the Euro Metropole meant that we needed uh, to uh, give the exact perimeter of the territory. And uh, we needed to decide what would be the financial contributions, who would be the partners around the table. And what's interesting to see here is that this territory is a purely political administrative creation of 360,000 square kilometers more or less the surface of Luxembourg, with a number of municipalities uh, that were interested in this uh, cooperation between France and Belgium across the borders. These are the co-funders, uh, these are the net contributors of the uh, EGTC, and so that's why we call it multi-level governance. Each contributor funds the work of a team of eight people in Kortrijk, and through this we uh, fund an establishment in France with a uh, decision-making body in Belgium. So the headquarters in France, the operational team in Kortrijk, and uh, the uh, civil society in Belgium. So the partners are the historical partners. We have different partners, as you can see. On the lower part of the um, slide, you see intercommunality structures, 
um, this is not the Belgian or the French uh, understanding of the word. We call them intercommunalities. Uh, then the second line are the departments and the provinces. French departments, the Belgian provinces, and then we have the regional level. In France, the uh, uh, com the Flanders region, Wallonia, and then at the highest level we have the French Republic and Belgium. So this cooperation, we're still talking about borders, uh, but we have actually three borders because there is also a language border which has made the cooperation even more complex than it usually is. And so we are bilang bilingual in our Euro metropole, so we speak Dutch and French. This is merely a reminder. So specifically speaking, the governance of Euro metropole, because we were talking about uh, sustainability and a uh, kickoff period, where well, we needed to put in place a system of governance to be able to monitor uh, the uh, funding that had been earmarked. We wanted to make sure that this was in line with the strategy that the elected people uh, had intended. But if you look at the governance of this particular EGCT, well, you see that in order to gather uh, all the people, you need to have 84 people. People, but we're able to decide that the quorum would be half plus one. Now, we had to modify our bylaws and adapt to the fact that sometimes there would be a lack of political representativeness in our um, representation. So this is part of a, another challenge that we had to face with. And now, we have working groups um, with elected people, two partners of the Euro Metropole, and the representatives of civil society, which is part and parcel of the development of the strategy of the EGTC. And uh, there is, uh, this gives you a rough idea of how we work um, above and beyond the borders. So we have a political administrative governance, participative uh, uh, governance, because everybody is part of the process. And so it's a multi-level governance. So representation is uh, by section, and we have a two-year term of office. So two years for France, then two years for Belgium, one year Flemish, one year uh, uh, French speaking. And so that's how we try to have continuity amongst the various uh, people in leadership. It's not always possible because every president wishes to leave a mark on the activity. And that's why uh, this is what we see also in the Council of the European Union, by the way. Now, without uh, having a big debate about funding, we work with a budget of roughly 1.2 a million per year. I'm part of the team and I represent the team and I have uh, two of my collaborators who came here with me. Now we fund a third of the team. So out of 1.2 million, one third goes to the uh, funding of the operations of the team who will uh, cater for the territory and the rest is earmarked for specific projects. These contributions are, have not changed over the last 13 years. So uh, we have not changed our modus operandi since the very creation of the Euro Metropole. It doesn't mean, I mean, my purpose here is not to say that we don't have enough. Actually, we've been like diversifying through interreg projects. And so for us, this is particularly important. We wanted that to diversify, to continue to have, to put pressure on the territorial presence uh, in this territory. So do we need more stable uh, and more sustainable funding? Yes and no, because we have the guarantee uh, of getting funding from the 14 institutional partners. And so far, the decisions has always been uh, reconducted. But we also need external funding, because if we want to uh, strengthen our capacity and if we want to reach out 
the two million citizens of the uh, region, we need supplementary uh, means uh, by reaching out to civil society. If you look carefully at this table, you will see that the French are contributing more than the Belgians. So that's what we call a double contribution because Belgium has uh, two administrative um, uh, systems. So we have uh, two sources which are being shared uh, over the two levels of uh, powers in Belgium. So right from the beginning of the creation of this Euro Metropole, there was um, two years of presidency for France, two years for Wallonia, two years for Flanders. But we changed that by having uh, uh, more rotation so by changing the bylaws of Euro Metropole, as I indicated at the very beginning. So where is the money coming from? Well, with through the interreg um, uh, projects, uh, we've been able to uh, fund a number of uh, projects, micro project, and this enabled us to uh, set or put in place a uh, uh, sustainable collaboration. We wanted to have a kickoff, and then through our own uh, capital, we wanted to um, have a sustainable action. And here you have uh, examples Blue Walks, Blaue Reut, uh, Carré Bleu, and, uh, trans and the Interact projects uh, focusing on transport or labor project. This is part of the strategy. The idea is not to always be uh, funded through the same uh, Interact projects, but we want to see what other projects are being uh, examined by the uh, board of directors. There are two other sources, the B Solutions uh, project for which we seek support from B Solution. What you will not see on the slide, and I apologize uh, to Jean, there is also a cooperation with Lamotte, especially uh, for some of the projects that have been agreed on recently. So this is a p policy based on cohesion. We believe that we need to have funding based not just on one source of funding, but also systemic funding. So we are facing certain challenges too. So as you probably gathered, we seek recognition from civil society because having PPPs, a public-private partnership, will enable us to have a larger and more diversified sources of funding. But those are not uh, direct sources of uh, funding that we receive from the civil society. It's the investment from private activities in on our territory. So we are facilitators in this case. So when we talk about engagement from civil society, it means that we have to give a lot of time, of human time, because it takes a lot of time to uh, create um, cross-border cooperation, but it's also, it takes very little time to destroy all those efforts if you don't pay attention, if you don't cater the um, relationship. And with Eurometropole, we realized that um, we had a trial and error period, but we were able to s make some funding sustainable. Sometimes we miscalculated the amount we needed and uh, we are now working with the Département du Nord and the Lille Metropolis to have a specific uh, house, Belgium, France, uh, and we would like blue buses to be able to cross the border where people would be speaking both French and Dutch for the benefit of the users. Now, there are several challenges. I'm not going to talk about the contribution of partners, which is something which we have heavily discussed in the in the General Assemblies, and we just had elections, and recently in Belgium, we paid, we, we, we voted for the uh, 
European Parliament for the federal um, uh, elections and regional elections. And soon we're going to have uh, um, uh, munis municipal e elections. Uh, so that means that 50 people out of the, the 84 members, 50 might leave. It's only the French part of uh, the partners who will remain stable, even though France will have its own elections soon. So these are the uh, challenges that we are facing. So there are advantages to a multi-level governance, but uh, there are disadvantages too, and especially in troubled times like these. Um, I will conclude with some recommendations because I want to leave time to the others. Now, recommendations for the future. This implies that in the future, we want to have achieve greater proximity. We've been talking about macro, regional and regional governance. Obviously, this is paramount, of paramount importance, but the issue of being able to interview people and canvassing in the municipalities is just as important for us. And that's why we have the so-called proximity meetings, which enable us to understand why the authorities of the municipalities of our metro, uh, Euro Metropole are investing in this because, um, you know, you wonder what's, the, what's in it for uh, the taxpayers. Well, uh, the idea is not to fantasize about public uh, finances. We want to uh, connect uh, the finances with uh, the reality about uh, waste management, about recognition of uh, degrees, but it also means attracting um, uh, territorial cooperation, and this is something that can only be achieved through civil society. Civil society recognized it had been integrated in our by in our bylaws in uh, 2018, and when we modified the bylaws uh, to allow uh, rotation between uh, France and Belgium, there are 80 members from civil society from France and Belgium so that we can also cover uh, areas that had not been covered before. Uh, so we want to make sure that wherever there is um, a loophole in the uh, territorial uh, cooperation, we need to uh, address that. We need to recognize that sometimes things are not perfect. And so that's why we have come up with B solution and we've approached also Lamotte. I'm going to stop right there. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, Loïc. Et ça va passer à... Thank you very much, Ingrida, now. and to remind us of the link between elections and resources and the capacity to generate resources. Thank you for telling us more about that. Ingrida. Hello, everybody. Uh, since we are the youngest EGTC here, we are extremely thankful for OECD for possibility to participate here with all of you, and uh, uh, we are very excited to hear about activities, achievements, and challenges uh, by experienced EGTCs. And sure, we are happy to present our first steps towards establishment of full-blooded cross-border organization. <clears throat> Uh, the Euro Region Niemen uh, Association and the Little City Municipality are the founding members of EGTC Niamunas Niemen, established in 2023, and supporting Polish Lithuanian cross border cooperation. It takes the name of our of Lithuanian biggest river, who passes through our border, Niamunas in Lithuanian and Niemen in Polish. Uh, prior to 2000, 
2022, both actors have been involved in the cross-border union Euroregion Neman Neamunas Neman that supported cross-border cooperation between Poland, Lithuania, Russia, Kaliningrad Oblast, and Belarus. This cooperation was suspended by the Polish and Lithuanian counterparts in March 2022, following the escalation of Russia's large-scale aggression against Ukraine. Uh, how the decision was taken to create a new EGTC. Uh, the de decision to create Niamunas uh, Niemen EGTC reflects the wish of Polish and Lithuanian regional stakeholders to improve the tools and mechanism available for cross-border cooperation while strengthening economic, social, and territorial cohesion and resilience. The GTC aims to include local self-governments from two regional level border counties in southern Lithuania, Elitus and Mariampoli, and from three border subregions in northeastern Poland, Bialystok, Elk, and Suwalki. At the moment, it includes as members uh, Euroregion Niemen from Polish side and Elitus City Municipality from uh, the Lithuanian, hoping to expand in some time. Uh, what are reasons and fields of our cooperation? Uh, sure, we share not only border, but also the challenges. First of all, it is a uh, hundred kilometers long Suwalki gap border between the two countries is located between Russia and Belarus and is considered one of Europe and NATO's most vulnerable regions to possible Russian military aggression. The Polish-Lithuanian border region has also struggled with successive migration crises, first because of smuggling channels set up by Belarus to funnel migrants from other countries across the EU border, and then following the arrival of many Ukrainian refugees into Poland and Lithuania after 2022. Ensuring the absorption, uh, absorption of Ukrainian ref refugees and creating the condition to the integration to society presents a significant challenge for the cross-border region. Uh, the border areas as such is characterized by relatively low level of economic wealth that can make it harder to deal with challenges of integrated cross-border service, delivery, and migrant absorption. Polish and Lithuanian border counterparts has identified a shared interest in cooperating on health, energy, security, social security and innovation, culture and tourism issues in order to reinforce the region's resilience. Uh, according to the status of the EGTC, the assets of the grouping can consist of financial contributions from the founders and membership fees, grants for, from European Union projects and programs and other sources, donations and inheritances from nature and, uh, and legal persons. The Namunas Niemen GTC does not carry out any economic activities so far. As agreed at the founding meeting of the EGTC, no or minimal only cost will be generated for the operation of the EGTC until funds are raised from external sources. Thus, for the time being, the costs related to the operation of the EGTC are covered by the members' own funds. Uh, the grouping performs the tasks set out in the status through territorial cooperation project co financed by European Union. Uh, through European Region and De Development Fund, the European Social Fund, and the Cohesion Fund, as well as projects without a financial contribution from the EU Union. <clears throat> the scope and task uh, and the specificity of the legal nature of the EGTC Namunas Niemen as a joint Polish Lithuanian entity determines that the main source of funding for the grouping activities will be European Union funds, so mostly. Uh, Interact program. And sure, we can, may also be beneficiaries of other international and transnational cooperation programs. And as a uh, source for funding could be Polish and Lithuanian national and regional programs. Uh, 
despite we are just beginning, uh, we see that funding and fin financing challenges cause a lack of sufficient capital for startup. Despite of that, uh, the obtaining European Union fund support takes time. An application for funding of the development of a cross-border AGTC strategy was submitted for Interreg 4, Lithuania Poland cooperation program, and we are awaiting for uh, evaluation results. The uh, project was submitted in uh, uh, January, and we are still waiting. <laughs> Unfortunately, the first attempt to submit an application for strategic project for the development of cultural historical tourism route on the Polish-Lithuanian border, the magical land of Yotunjians, uh, was not successful, but we expect to be granted the second chance and to uh, submit an improved project idea with improved partnerships. So. Uh, what lessons have we learned during very fresh process of creation of our AGTC? What can we share with, with uh, those who are coming with uh, this attempt, idea? So first of all, be sure that attitudes towards aims, priorities, expectations, ways of actions and cooperation match and are perceived similarly on the both sides of the border. Build and maintain the trust, respect, and responsibility among the partners. It is not for granted. It is a permanent process. Ensure sufficient resources for successful startup, both human and material. And communicate, communicate, please communicate. <laughs> and always remember that together we can achieve more. Thank you. Thank you, Ingrida, very much for sharing with us your experience and, and showing us sort of the challenge of, of starting something and, and this almost need for a very entrepreneurial spirit at the beginning, as well as the importance of trust between the partners. And I think that that's something we don't talk very much about, but that's really critical. So I'd like to now invite uh, Romina to uh, share with us your experience. So good afternoon to everybody. Um, thank you for the organizers for having invited us also to take part in this uh, uh, discussion, although we are not part of the pilot uh, EGTC studied. So really thank you because you gave us the opportunity to share our experience today and to listen also to the others, uh, which is always something uh, very important. And uh, so I'm the last one speaker for this afternoon, so I will ask you to keep, uh, to maintain the attention for not more than 10 minutes. Uh, I will assure you that I will be uh, quick and um, efficient, I hope. so. Um, I will just give you some information about who we are, at least for those who uh, still don't know us. Uh, so who we are, where we are, because uh, it's uh, true, all the GTC are similar, but also in terms of funding, uh, it uh, really depends a lot of uh, the territory where we are working. So uh, these are information I, I would like to share with you. And then concerning funding tools, which is the topic of this panel, I will share with you the information about, uh, uh, in particular, two, in, uh, two funding tools we have experienced, uh, the integrated territorial uh, investments and uh, the small project fund, which is something that we are managing uh, right now. So I, I'm not going to talk uh, with you about all the other things we did. So <laughs> just <laughs> these two. Um, let's see if it's working. It's not moving. No, I think because it's a PDF and so, okay, thank you. So um, the EGTC Go, the one I'm representing is uh, an Italian public body 
Uh, it was established already in 2010. So on the contrary of Ingrid, we are a little uh, older. <laughs> and uh, it has been established by three municipalities. One in Italy, Gorizia, and the two other, Nova Gorizia and Schempeter Vertoiba, two small municipalities in Slovenia. Altogether, these uh, uh, three uh, towns uh, are covering something like uh, 72,000 inhabitants. So you can understand uh, three towns uh, together are like uh, one small city. So that's why also is important to understand <laughs> the area we are covering. And uh, what is important is uh, that uh, the EGTC have jurisdiction over the territory of the three cities. This is the real added value of having, in this case, the EGTC. And you will understand why. Concerning the structure, it's um, a very simple structure, and we are proud of it, um, because otherwise it will be really hard to manage the thing at cross-border level. And this doesn't mean that it's easy, but it's not so hard that it could be. So our structure is organized in this way. We have an assembly with one president, three majors without the right to vote, and 14 members which are appointed by the municipal councils. The assembly, through its, uh, its uh, permanent committees, which are uh, dealing with, uh, let's say, the main uh, topics, uh, uh, strategic topics uh, for our area, are deciding or proposing strategies and goals they want to reach together at cross-border level. So we are always talking about cross-border strategies. The, let's say, administrative part of the EGTC is composed by the CEO, the Secretariat, and the Office for Project Management. This administrative side is the one that has to keep in mind the strategies and the goals, uh, which are from the assembly, go in search of the funding, actually, and uh, transform these strategies and goals into projects and investments. Fundings can come from different ways. Uh, from the European, of course, we are managing European project, but not, not only. Also from the state, from the uh, Slovene side or the Italian side, in our case, mostly from the regional side. You know, in Italy we have regions, and Friuli Venezia region is an autonomous region, which uh, is mostly also helping us and financing directly. Um, so, Having in mind the structure, we have been, um, let's say, a step, uh, so on the basis of the clear strategy or a clear goal, then we have decided um, which project to be applied and uh, we found the funding, let's say. The ITI, so the Integrated Territorial Investment, uh, is uh, uh, one of uh, uh, the biggest challenges we have work on it. Uh, it's uh, um, an instrument that have been introduced in the previous programming period by the Interreg Italy Slovenia program in our area, which is the program, the cross-border program, uh, most important for us. Already in the programming period, uh, the managing authority at that time with the steering committee decided to introduce the ITI projects in the program and identified the EGTC GO as the sole beneficiary that can develop those uh, projects. So two were the ITI projects. We were um, um, called to develop. One dedicated to the conservation protection of the natural and cultural heritage of the cross-border area, the so-called Izonzo Socha, the name is the name of the river that is crossing uh, between uh, Gorizia and Nova Gorizia. And the second one was on the health sector, I will show you later on. Both uh, ITI projects were the same structure, 
and the same uh, period. There was a funding dedicated about 5 million euro. In the case of this first uh, uh, ITI project, is on Sosocha, the structure was divided into uh, four lots. We were able, in the cross-border area between Nova Gorica, Gorica, and Schempeter Vertoiba, to create a recreation camp. Uh, a foot footbridge on the river is on Sosocha, and this was really a very important uh, investment. Uh, also, not only uh, because it was a hard investment, but also from the, um, let's say, uh, symbolic point of view, because we, we were able to uh, literally uh, build a bridge. So not only be uh, in, in words, but also uh, in concrete. And then um, we built up the first cycling path, uh, cross-border cycling path uh, that is crossing both sides of the, of the border. It's about, if I'm not wrong, 14 kilometers. So I will show you just some pictures uh, of uh, this important investment so that it has been concluded. Um, so here you can see the, the footbridge. Um, some paths, cycling paths. And these cycling paths are passing exactly from, you, if you will have the chance to come uh, and visit us, you can really enjoy and, and take a bike and go from a side to another without uh, noting in, in, any, in any part the, the, the border. And the other ITI project uh, was the one on health sector. So um, um, in, in that case, uh, um, let's say we took uh, also, uh, we studied the experience of uh, Sardinia, of course. <laughs> it's known, but uh, um, we did not build um, a structure on the border. We worked more on uh, services. Um, the situation in, in our case was that, that we have uh, in uh, a, a small area two hospitals, uh, one in Italy, one in Slovenia, and we decided to work on the complementary sectors. So we noticed that uh, on a side uh, there were the possibility to have uh, a good um, maternity area, which was absent in the other and the same for other sectors like autism, mental health, and social inclusion. So um, with this uh, goal, we worked on um, team building. So we tried to put together the uh, technicians, uh, medical assistants uh, uh, from both sides of the border to try to exchange information, work together, and uh, Let's say it was uh, um, a mut mutual learning, I would say, from both sides. And uh, also in concrete, we uh, renew some um, areas. We buy some um, new machines for the hospitals. And, um, and, and also in this case, uh, the budget was about 5 million euro for both sides. So. It, let's say, um, equally distributed among the parts. Uh, what is uh, also to be mentioned is that uh, for both the projects, we were able to spend the 99% of the budget. So spent, uh, report, uh, and so we were really uh, very successful also in this reporting uh, part, which is uh, also another uh, for you, if you want to do such projects, it's also really very hard. So also here, I jump sharing some pictures. Uh, um, everything has been concluded, uh, all the buildings also, although here there are some pictures uh, um, still old, but we have closed all the infrastructures. Um, for that project in particular, for the health one, we were also uh, nominated for some uh, awards, uh, so just for us <laughs> to remember. 
And uh, here there's a picture. I will, okay, the picture there's no, but while we were managing the ITI projects uh, in 2019, um, our municipalities, Gorizia and Nova Gorizia, together decided to apply for the European Capital of Culture 2025. Uh, also in that case, uh, they decided uh, to ask the EGTC go to be the coordinator of the application, but also the one that will be then engaged in the future management of the award. We, will, uh, we won the nominee, so next year we will also be capital of culture in Nova Gorizia and Gorizia, so you are all invited on the 8th of February for the uh, <laughs> opening. Uh, but um, why I'm telling you that? Because uh, in order to support the candidacy and the European Capital of Culture, again, the Interreg Italy Slovenia program in the, in the uh, actual programming period decided to support uh, the, the, the candidacy, the European Capital of Culture, uh, including in the programming, uh, the small project fund as a new instrument, uh, and again, the EGTC Go has been indicated as uh, the beneficiary of the small project fund, but in this case, as management body. So we had first the experience with the ITI as implementing body, and now this experience uh, lead us also to experience this new program the small project fund as management body. So uh, let's say we can say that we are in a part a sort of a small managing authority. So we are facing with management uh, issues in this case. Um, so uh, I can skip here and go. Uh, the, the fund is about 7 million euro. Uh, we have foreseen to have one call per year. So we started uh, the management of the fund uh, in 2023. So the main goal is to uh, cover with the projects uh, the year of the European Capital of Culture. So we have planned that we can reach that goal uh, managing one call per year. Um, we already uh, closed one call. So the first call um, lead us received 239 applications, uh, out of which um, we have financed 44 projects. <laughs> Those projects are small projects. This means that projects of amount that are going from 30,000 to a maximum of 200,000. Those projects has maximum two partners, so are really small and uh, uh, close to the territory. So um, associations, small association, uh, those actors that normally have difficulties in applying to the normal, let's say, standard projects of uh, interreg programs uh, are, let's say, our targets, uh, target groups. And uh, it's true, uh, because uh, numbers are demonstrating that there is a huge number of these kind of actors that normally are outside the interreg programs uh, and funded in a small project fund uh, their opportunity. In our case, let's say that it was also easy because uh, we have a clear goal for 2025 and all these association are trying to find a way to participate to the year of the capital of culture. And here they, they can at least try. But the added value is that these are all, yes, I will close soon, soon, um, are all cross-border projects. And this is also very important. Um, now we have closed the second call um, and we have uh, additional 134 projects uh, um, under evaluation. Uh, the difference uh, from the first call is that here we addressed the topics. So in the first call we left, uh, let's say it was uh, open to the fantasy <laughs> of uh, the beneficiaries. 
Um, in that case, uh, we decided to focus on specific topics that for us were important and not yet addressed. So we will see what will came out also from the second call. And that's it for now. So I thank you again and I'm open for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much and for sharing your um, your experience with the funding and financing and how that, that can run across a variety of different types, so ITIs to small projects. That's, that was great. Thank you. Um, I'm going to open this up now. I have questions for the panel, but I really first want to know if there are any questions from all of you regarding uh, how funding and financing goes along. Yes, please. Bonjour, Adela Ordangarin, directrice du GST Euroregion. I'm uh, the head of uh, another EGCT at uh, the Navarra Aquitaine border. I had a question for Loïc regarding the difference of contributions for the different EGTC members. What does that imply, the different contributions amongst members? Is there a problem? Does that create problems between uh, members? How do you handle this difference? The reason why I'm asking is because we have three regions, and each region has to contribute to the same amount. Actually, there are no problems amongst us. So everybody uh, is working towards the same goal, actually. So maybe sometimes you hear some comments saying, but we're contributing more than other partners, and that maybe uh, there should be special attention given to our project. But there is no tension now. I don't know how come that is, but that's the way it is. I mean, there was a point in time when I arrived eight years ago when we were talking about decreasing the contributions because the area was extremely large and we thought that we needed to focus more on the border uh, concept. And so maybe that's why we decided to level out the level of contributions, but the general interest prevailed. Now, without having a long debate, if I were to reopen the discussion on the bylaws and if I were to suggest uh, a different uh, share uh, of contributions, but this is not a subject that I want to, to reopen, to tell you the truth. Uh, Romina or Ingrida, do you have anything to add to this? The splitting of the... Uh, as I said, it's, um, our structure is easy because we have only three municipalities. Uh, they are contributing uh, every year uh, with small quotes. This year, for the first time, we asked uh, to increase the quote because uh, of uh, uh, the European Capital of Culture preparation. So the, the work really increased, uh, and um, the European Capital of Culture is not a project uh, properly said uh, with the dedicated financing. So also in that case, we have to search uh, for. And so it was uh, quite, let's say, uh, normal for us also to ask the municipalities to, to contribute a little uh, much more in that case. So let's, I hope that they will continue also after the European Capital of Culture, of course. Yes. Okay. We have equal membership contribution on both, or from both partners so far, but maybe in the future, maybe strategy will show that we will need something different. Are there other... Uh, um, yes, a question to, to, to Romina, because from Brussels we uh, use the example of Gorica Nova Gorica and this uh, European Year of Culture also to show the possibility of embedding cooperation into also mainstreams 
program. So for what we know uh, now, I mean, th there is this small project fund that you are managing, but there are also, in relation to this, this uh, uh, Slovenian uh, mainstream program and uh, the, the regional one contributing to the renovation of, of, of this place uh, between Gorica and Nova Gorica. And for us, uh, it's supposed to be a very good example in terms of financing and co-financing uh, when, when the, the objective and the strategy is set and there is a clear uh, common objective that f funding can come from also not only from Interreg and cross-border cooperation. So, but I don't know, uh, so from your point of view, if this is uh, working, it's the beginning of something or not. Uh, thank you, Valeria, for the question. Yes, uh, it's a very important point because if we will be successful with this uh, I think then we can continue on this on this path. For for those that don't know, we are uh, renovating uh, um, the cross border square we have between Gorica and Nova Gorica, which will be the symbol of the whole European capital of culture because it's exactly uh, on the border. Uh, to do that, uh, the investment is huge. And fundings uh, are coming, uh, so we, there was a really a uh, very important and long uh, study to find uh, the right fi funding way and combine uh, different legislations and uh, everything you can imagine happening exactly on the border. At the end, uh, we reach a, uh, we find a solution because the works are going on, have started. Uh, the investment is going, so really everything is going. And uh, the, um, the investment is uh, a combination of funding coming from the um, national Slovene state, uh, from the regional government, uh, so Friuli Venezia Giulia region, and uh, uh, from another side, from the municipality, municipalities, both directly being this investment also something that will be included in both uh, uh, urban agendas, of course. So it's uh, really a mixed mechanism of funding uh, coming from Europe, nation, and municipalities. And uh, so for now, the things are going on. <laughs> so, and uh, keep uh, fingers crossed uh, also when uh, it will come to reporting, because here is still something we don't know. We are not yet in that phase, but uh, at least workings are going on. So, so thank you for the question. Thank you. Uh, is there another, any other questions from any of you? We are coming, oops, we are coming to the end of the day, but I do have a few questions for our panelists, and I hope that these will also be enlightening for all of you. And I'd like to start actually with, with Loic. And um, you, you, in, your, in your discussion, you, you mentioned the working structure of, of Eurometropole, uh, that it was created. And I'd be really interested in knowing about how the working groups that you've established help Eurometropole mobilize the contributions, mobilize the financial contributions or the in-kind contributions, because I think that's really quite unique in what you're doing. Um, so how does it mobilize these contributions to support the organization and the implementation of, of different activities? And if you have an example, that would be really helpful. Oui, donc. As I reminded, all the working groups over the last eight years have been structured through a triangle. These are technicians, representatives of our partners, but also members of the civil society. So whenever I open the box of the civil society, we're talking about members of uh, the academic world. It could be people working in uh, the travel sector. Now, you know, we have a Parc Bleu, the blue park uh, of the metropole, so anything connected with water, because there are no borders in waters. And so that's what we've called Le Carré Bleu, the blue square. And this was an idea that germinated in the working group. And uh, it was facilitated by the um, 
EGCT. So we didn't really mobilize funding in this case, but it enabled uh, to have this uh, cross-gemination, so it was a, a, a cooperation with uh, tourist offices uh, to identify which would be the proper uh, passageways of these uh, psychopaths. Uh, so the idea can be exported elsewhere because we wanted to promote uh, Europe and we wanted to uh, solidify their uh, objectives. So we checked what were their goals, we consulted them and helped them achieve their projects. Now, if you take another aspect that has absolutely nothing to do with uh, soft mobility, civil society, we developed a subjective uh, map of uh, the feeling of belonging to the cross-border uh, culture. So we developed uh, the concept of Euro Metropole. So it's a feast day organized uh, between France and Belgium. It was supported by the Euro Metropole, but there were also contributions that uh, were provided by partners uh, to the project. So we create the conditions thanks to the Euro Metropole, but the partners can also bring in some uh, contributions. It's not that simple, as I say, because this is also uh, funded by other partners who are part of Euro Metropole. So rapidly, you are in a follow funnel of create creativity. So if you want to have extra funding, ask your um, donor, donors who are already funding this. So the Francophones in Belgium are going to tell us, why don't you ask the Brussels area? The Brussels area is already funding some initiatives. And so that's why we're trying to diversify the means. And it's a, a, a fine balance uh, of all these uh, elements. At some point in time, you know, it might seem, sound as if I'm re repeating myself, but for me, this is where you can start uh, a form of uh, cross-border um, cooperation. Uh, then there is the aspect of scalability. You know, you can start with a small project. We had a call for small project and there were very few applicants because, you know, in order to be able to submit a project, you need to be an expert. <laughs> you know, I'm not referring to Olivier here. I'm joking. But, you know, regional uh, authorities are sometimes making it extremely complex. So since we are specialists in projects, we try to assist people in uh, applying for uh, funds for projects because we know how to do that. In, in, your, in your EGTC. Um, I'm going to ask your indulgence just for a couple more minutes because I have one question for uh, Ingrida. Ingrida, often uh, EGTC statutes show that the financial contributions of the founding members, it, it, let's say, the financial contributions of the founding members are incorporated into the EGT statute. But I understand that in your EGTC, that was not the case. And if you could just in very shortly explain why you chose to do something differently, why you decided not to put them in the statute. Well, we hope that strategy will show what exactly it should look like. And now we have a very symbolic contribution. It is only 1,000 euros from each side. So for sure, it is not enough. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> also, it's the same with, with uh, our human resources. Sure, it is not enough. Yeah. So it was very but, symbolic. Yes, and we hope that, that uh, we have a success with project and uh, we'll get more means and we'll have uh, for bigger, for, for more staff, more of staff, and that's the beginning. Okay. Thank you very much. And also a final question for Romina. 
Um, and you can choose between the ITI and the small, the small fund project. But in their implementation, when you went to implement them, what do you consider to have been the main challenges, but also the main benefits of, of using these financing mechanisms? Um, if, uh, let's talk about the ITI, because it's closed, <laughs> it's easier. <laughs> um, the ITI, so the integrated investment, uh, was uh, itself a challenge because it was uh, a new instrument and uh, we were young. <laughs> and um, so it was uh, uh, itself uh, really um, the challenge, I would say, because you had to compare also already in that case also different legislations uh, to keep in mind that you are in two states. Uh, so there are still these uh, issues uh, that we have to face, it, face with. And, uh, and the benefit at the end was uh, um, the, the investment itself. So we can say that the ITI was a challenge at the beginning and it became uh, the benefit for the territory. Yes, yeah, I think that uh, this is what I think, yes. Okay, thank you very, very much. Um, we are ending our day together and our time at this panel. I'd like to thank everyone for your attention and your questions. I'd like to thank the interpreters as well for speaking all day long. Um, I believe, Olivia, there's a dinner as well in where we had lunch or probably, okay. So yes, I'm gonna assume because that's the only place that there would be a dinner. Um, and invite you to join us. And we will see you again tomorrow here in this very room for the final panel discussion on um, political support or advocacy and um, communication. And then also a workshop where we would really appreciate all of your input into the analytical framework and the tool itself so that we can finalize it in a way that is most relevant to cross-border regions. Thank you very much. Thank you.